Island Assembly, Senate Chamber, program sound. Okay, good morning, members of Fodger Row of Alig, and welcome. We now, I now declare the meeting of the Health Committee open to the public online. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of our members who are participating this morning by video conferencing, and I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. So no apologies have been received this morning. Um, and moving on then to chairperson's business. So a number of us there yesterday did a, a meeting with the Children's Law Centre and WIPIC on the Vulnerable Children and Young People's Plan that we had discussed after, after that session. Um, the meeting, I think, was very, very useful, I have to say, uh, if concerning in some regards, and I, but I would like to thank both the Children's Law Centre and WIPIC for attending. It was also great to hear directly from one of WIPIC's ambassadors on their experiences during the pandemic, and I want to thank Rebecca in particular for that uh, input, uh, invaluable for, for the committee. At yesterday's meeting, there was a specific issue raised by the young person in relation to mental health counselling for young people in care, and it was good to hear how beneficial that has been. However, there are concerns now being raised that there was limited provision at the present time, uh, resulting in a limit on the number of sessions young people could avail of. So if members are content, uh, committee, we could write to the department to outline the importance of that service and to request the department increases the provision of mental health counselling to children and young people in care and increases the number of sessions that can be availed of. Would yeah, members be yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll come. I'll, yeah. Also, if members are content, we should seek, I think, a written update from the department on progress of the action plan and how submissions from stakeholders have fed into that action plan. Um, because I think it's it's clear that there's a number of outstanding issues of concern which don't appear to be um, kind of getting picked up on. So um, would members be content that we seek a written update from the department on progress of the action plan? Great. Yeah. Thank you, members. And I think then that over the coming months, we should continue our engagement with these groups as we continue to consider the Vulnerable Children and Young People Action Plan and the Adoption and Committee, uh, the Adoption and Children Bill, which will be coming to us after Easter. So I think I think that's a very useful engagement in terms of uh, real-time information on what's happening on the ground. So other, other events just of, of note during the past week, I did attend a meeting with the Dietitian Association on food poverty. Um, and I have to say it was very stark in terms of the inequalities and the exacerbation of inequalities as a result of food poverty. Um, it is, I think, a, a, a shameful reflection in some ways on our society that food banks uh, have continued to be in existence and are almost normalized. And while those are doing fantastic and necessary work, I think the, their, their very existence is in some ways an area that, that we should be considering and, and looking at how we address uh, food poverty. And they, they would be suggesting that there's a need for a food strategy here that deals with food outside of simply the context of agriculture. And I think that is something that, that is a relevant point to make and that, that's something that would be good to look at in the future. I also, along with a number of other... Yes, go ahead. Is that Carol? Yes, sorry, Chair. It's just on that issue. Um, when I was in communities, I met with a consultant paediatricians that work in the Children's Hospital in the Royal around some of the impacts of poverty on children's health. If we're going to get future presentations, I think the committee could certainly benefit from those witnesses. They were, they were quite compelling. Yeah, and, and we have actually touched upon that as, as something that we would like to, so maybe we will put that somewhere into the forward work program for consideration because it's obviously key to health and well-being and social care and so many other issues that cross cut with us and with communities indeed so yeah um if members are content we'll we'll consider that in the future um also myself and a number of other members i know P paula was certainly there and maybe pam did a meeting with the endometriosis sufferers and organizations during the week and you know that remains a very vexed issue in terms of services and in terms of waiting times and all of that and um, any want to say anything in relation to that um, 
Sorry, um, Chair, uh, um, thank you for raising that issue. I um, I thought it was a very powerful meeting. Um, I certainly had a lot to take away in terms of what is wrong with the service, and I followed up with a number of Assembly questions to the Health Minister to try and get a baseline of where the service, the endometriosis service is in Northern Ireland, not just in the Belfast area. So I think once we get that, then we can maybe look at that as a committee, because I think that there are a lot of women out there who are suffering suffering needlessly month after month and are turning up the emergency department when they could be getting care in the primary care setting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it was a powerful meeting and some powerful some powerful testimonies about the real impact that that's having. So look at. Uh, and the final one then that I want to just touch upon is I attended an event with the pharmacy forum where they were putting a focus on racism. Um, a really, really good meeting as well, very well structured meeting, but but putting, you know, highlighting the fact that that people out there in our community, in our pharmacies, are being met with microaggressions, as they're referred to, and, and straight up racism at times, you know, things along the lines of people being asked, um, can I have somebody else serve me? Do you have an English name? Absolutely disgraceful. And, and I, I, I want to acknowledge and uh, commend the pharmacy forum for tackling that so head on and in such a structured way. And I think that was a really, a really powerful and, and I want to wish them well. I know they're continuing with that work. They're doing a number of other webinars in relation to that. And I would encourage members, if any of you get an opportunity to attend any of those, I think they're, they're very, it's a very worthwhile piece of work within pharmacy, obviously, but also within our wider society. I think there's important lessons there for all of us. So uh, I, I want to thank them for the invite and for the, for the highlighting and raising those issues. We're, we're very aware of how much community pharmacy have been at the, ver at the front line in relation to COVID and the pressures they were under even prior to COVID. So that's, that's, that's that, uh, members, thank you for that. And moving on then to draft minutes, I refer you there to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 18th of March, which is, which is a tab 3.1 of your pack. Are members content with those minutes? Yeah, thank you, members. Matters arising then, there are no matters arising from that session. So we move on then, members, to our first substantive briefing today, which is from the Royal College of GPs and the BMA uh, NIGP committee. This is an update from both of those groups. Members had previously requested a briefing on GP services, and we are awaiting a response from the department to queries raised by members. I refer members to the papers at tab five of your pack. These include a paper from the Royal College on GP services post-COVID, the Mental Health Action Plan, which is specifically on pages 56 and 57 of your pack, and relevant recent correspondence to the committee uh, on a range of those issues. So I would now like to welcome and to ask Broadcasting to bring up into the spotlight Dr. Lawrence Dorman, who is chairperson of the Royal College of General Practitioners here in the North. Are you able to hear us there okay, Lawrence? Thank you, Chair. I can hear you clearly. Thank you. And we're also, uh, Dr. Dorman is joined by Dr. Alan Sturt, who is chairperson of the GP committee for the British Medical Association here. And if I can ask for Dr. Sturt to be brought up into the spotlight, can you hear us there, Alan? Uh, yes, I can, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, listen, you're both very, very welcome this morning. Um, we we uh, appreciate your attendance here at, at the committee today, and we look forward to hearing your briefing and also to a bit of a question and answer session with members. So, uh, can two doctors are leading off, but if you'd advise, please. Uh, yes, good, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Committee. I'll, uh, I'll lead off if uh, you're happy with that. And, uh, and just to say thank you for inviting us this morning, and it's nice to, to see you all this morning. I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes, and then Lawrence will follow and add uh, a little bit more uh, after that. Um, so just to start, I mean, it does go without saying that it's been a really tough year in general practice uh, and much like the rest of the system, but it's also shown and highlighted more than ever the vital role that general practice has in the whole system and also particularly to each and every individual. We're now exactly a year on, believe it or not, from the opening of the COVID centres, uh, and these have provided a vital role in keeping our practices open, clean and safe and able to deal with normal business and all of the normal non-COVID related problems, of which there are many. Uh, and I think we're all seeing that these are increasing rapidly. 
The COVID centres have also provided a critical primary care assessment of patients with COVID or with suspected COVID and have significantly reduced the pressures on our hospitals and contributed hugely to the overall COVID response. We've actually now just hit 30, just over 38,000 patients have attended the COVID centres. Practices have run a dual service from the outset, both staffing the COVID centres and also their own practice, while also, also delivering the flu vaccine programme better than ever before. And now the COVID vaccination programme uh, and the figures and the success of this again highlight the vital role that practices have played in this. All of these equate to almost four jobs in one, with an ever increasing demand and a constrained, stressed, and extremely fatigued workforce. Uh, there's no question that every single GP is finding it very, very tough at the moment. This has actually been further challenged by the perception that GP practices have closed during the pandemic. We've all worked hard to ensure that patients uh, know that this is very far from their reality. There's been a number of joint communications sent out to the public via stakeholders, including all MLAs, to ensure that patients know that we have and we continue to deliver our services right throughout the pandemic. As you're well aware, general practice was under a huge uh, degree of pressure pre-pandemic, uh, so it is incredible that we've managed to deliver even more with so many constraints around workforce and resources and still meet an ever-increasing and an ever-complex demand. The commitment, the professionalism and the sheer determination of GPs and their practice teams have been both astounding and outstanding. In order to ensure that patients remain safe and that staff can continue to work, we have to change how we deliver care to our patients. We continue to see patients who need to be seen, but many other platforms are all used when clinically appropriate. Indeed, we've had a lot of feedback from patients who are extremely happy to see their GP virtually or speak on the phone. This has suited their busy lives uh, very often and allowed them to juggle work and family commitments and not ignore health concerns. It has also meant that practices are often able to deal with many more patients in the case of many practices in, and increase their same day access. However, the pressure on the workforce remains with an ever rising demand, which we anticipate will continue to rise uh, after the pandemic uh, has, has quietened. As we come out of the worst of COVID and start to rebuild our services, it's absolutely vital that primary care is enabled to provide a really strong foundation for the future health service with a sustainable model and an expanded workforce with the urgent full rollout of MDTs. We know more than ever that we have to move to a completely different model of healthcare, focusing on prevention, on proactive management and on population health, uh, and to reduce our dependence on hospitals and to once and for all address the inequalities that are still far too obvious. I'm happy to expand uh, on this on uh, further discussion and questions. So I'm going to finish uh, on a positive note as I hand over to Lawrence. The past year has seen us work better, quicker and more together than any of us ever remember. We've bypassed bureaucracy and we've focused on best care and clinical priorities and we've solved every problem that has been put in front of us. Uh, the opportunity is now huge to build on this and to establish a health service that is better than before and is fit for the future. So thank you very much for that, Alan. Uh, while secondary care services are rebuilding, it's vital that equivalent ambition and resource is also made available to general practice in Northern Ireland. The, the pandemic has highlighted the importance of primary care in our health service, and we must use this time to strengthen and, and make it fit to meet the needs of our patients. We know that our older patient population is growing rapidly, and with this comes challenges of multimorbidity and increased complexity. And time and again, evidence suggests that these patients are best cared for in the community. As Alan mentioned, general practice did not enter the pandemic in a good place. Survey data from our own GP colleagues car carried out by the Royal College of GPs in 2019 and cited in our vision document support, sustain, renew, and if references are available, highlighted that 26% of GPs indicated that they intended to retire within the next five years. And this is corroborated by statistical data, which we know that shows 25% of our GPs are aged 55 or over. More worryingly, still in that survey, 32% of GPs felt so stressed by the workload they felt once per week that they could not cope. 
The risk of COVID-19 transmission made the traditional model of busy practice waiting rooms impossible. A largely remote service became necessary for practices, and while front doors may have seemed closed, extremely GP, busy GPs and teams have continued to work very hard under very difficult conditions inside, providing telephone, video consultations, and where appropriate and in our patients' best interests, arranging face-to-face -face assessment either in the surgery or through a home visit. It's vital our patients recognise the difference between telephone triage and telephone consultation. Triage is a relatively quick process where a patient is assigned to a particular clinician or work stream, whereas a consultation is frequently a time-intense process which may take equally long, if not longer, than a face-to-face -face consult and may necessitate a face-to-face consult, face -face consult anyway. So a mechanism to help guide patients in the most appropriate service is essential. Historically, our GP surgeries were organised so patients were largely seen in the order they booked their appointment. So a small amount of information shared with our, with our surgeries can help patients enormously and ensure that other patients that same day can get the opportunity to speak to their doctor. GPs and our teams, we miss our patients. Our surgeries are empty of the chatter of children and patients being welcomed into our buildings. While remote consultations can be appreciated by many groups of patients who value their convenience, we recognise it's not uh, welcomed by all. There's no correct figure to define the ratio between remote and face-to-face -face assessment, and this will vary between practice demographic, the pressures a practice faces, and the ability of a GP to, to assess risk. So we are aware the ratio of remote versus face-to-face -face assessment varies between practices and across the region. So currently data provided by the Health and Social Care Board indicates a level of 33% of remote versus face-to-face -face consultations, but at the present there's no correct level of what this, this figure should be. So while we recognise it hasn't worked for all, it's important that as GPs we listen to our patients and we design our services around them with the aim of a blended model which meets their needs best while being manf mindful of, of, of our capacity. The mantra of right patient, right place, right time is as appropriate in general practice as in other parts of the health service and the role of our receptionists as valued skill care navigators is as important as well as enhancing the skill mix within our practices. So core to enhancing the skill mix in our practices is the MDT programme and this is a central commitment by the Department of Health in Northern Ireland to deliver our first contact patient care in the community. It is the top priority of the Royal College of GPs Northern Ireland to see this model rolled out across all 321 practices in Northern Ireland as it will offer the best comprehensive care for all our citizens and offers true ability to treat patients before time of crisis or worsening of their condition while also having abilities to offer opportunities to identify and address health inequalities in our society. In the model, our commitments to increase health visitor and district nursing numbers, and these community workers will play a vital role in reducing childhood traumas and improve community palliative care where patients can spend their last few days of life at home in comfort. The pandemic has caused a tsunami of low-grade depression, anxiety and societal stress, and frequently GPs are the most available medical professionals available to our patients. Prescribing data in Northern Ireland shows we do have higher rates of antidepressant medication compared with Scotland and England, and significantly higher rates of hypnotics and anxiolytics compared to England, Scotland and Wales. GPs need it access to a range of treatment options when treating mental health conditions and along with a full range of talking therapies offered by a community mental health hub, the MDT model within the GP practice at its core offers us the best way of doing this. So Chair, thank you very much for this invite today. We're very happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you, thank you both. Um, and and there are you've you've picked up on a number of the significant issues there and um, um, uh, Obviously, the the inequalities is something that just is overarching everything, and, and absolutely needs a focus. And I'm, I'm glad that both of you have referred to those in that in that context. I suppose my first question, uh, and if I could ask either of you to sort of pick up on on the question and answer section, if one of you could sort of deal with the substantive, and then if there's additional information from the other, and I'll just leave it up to yourselves to decide on on who picks up on any particular given question. But in relation to the multidisciplinary teams, and I think we, we do recognise very clearly the impact and the benefit that that can bring, um, and we're aware that that has, has slowed significantly. Are there any timelines around when these when the full rollout can be achieved? Is there any work ongoing as to what issues need to be addressed, or where are we at in, in terms of, and I know you mentioned the 321 practices in total, how many of the, out of that 321 are currently operating an MDT model, and what are the plans to roll that out more broadly across the north? 
So can I just for, for a few minutes there? So so the MDTs have been delivered by GP federations. GP federations are small uh, groups of practices who have come together, and there are 17 federations across the country. Uh, at the moment, the model has been rolled out to six of the 17 federations, but at time of of, of of this report, only one of those federations has been complete. So, so there is still a huge amount of work for this for this time to be ro rolled out. Uh, what would be very helpful for practices and federations would be for a clear timeline. So, while federations that haven't got the model or haven't been appointed to the model, there, there's huge structural work that can be done before the actual, you know. Go, go is given because one of the big things that we see with the, the MDTs is the impact on our, on our premises. Uh, GP premises, you know, are, are small. Uh, the, the introduction of these teams, there's a lot of team new team members, so we need extensions. And again, as we know, to do buildings work and so all that takes time. So if there was a clear timetable, that would be exceptionally helpful. Do you want to add in there, Alan? This one? Yeah, ju just to add to that, uh, Chair, that uh, that actually we, you, you mentioned inequalities at the beginning, and, and actually one of the big risks with MDTs is that uh, that we do risk increasing the, the inequalities because. The success so far, and as Lauren says, one area is is complete. There's uh, there's a number of others that are, are working at the moment, but there's there's a number that have have no uh, imminent start date. Uh, and actually, the the feedback so far from patients and from the practices is that it is so successful uh, a model uh, that that actually ironically we're going to by being successful we're going to increase the inequalities uh, and the areas that don't have it and and i mean i speak particularly around the mental health workers uh, you know with within those mdts and and that is something that we really need to focus on so that we get that uh, right across the service right across every patient every practice uh, you know here and 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 make sure that it is uh, an accessible service and, and yeah, tied into mental health. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Doctor. Yeah, tied, uh, tied in with the with the mental health workers as well as the social worker role. Uh, and again, this was an unroll unknown role really before they were introduced. But this has been highly successful, particularly in areas like dairy, uh, where patients who are facing health inequalities on food banks. Those social workers have been able to tie in with the food banks and, and address those. So it, it, it ties it in with the community. It's vital. Yeah, and, and and I share your concern, and, and I, I, you know there has been recent figures released there where, in terms of access to counselling services via GP, um, ranges in terms of assembly constituencies from a hundred percent of GP uh, practices, a hundred percent in East Antrim to as low as forty percent in West Tyrone. So I I think like is there work being done? to target the inequalities alongside what we're doing rather than rather than doing the work and then looking back and see the inequalities is it being front loaded in terms of the planning and preparation that the worst areas are being prioritized for the for the for the focus yeah, so so it's a it's a good question. Um, what what we did at the outset, uh, and we agreed with the department and the board on this, was that we would go what's called narrow and deep. So we would make sure that we we provided the full team uh, to to a small number of areas, and that was really to prove the concept uh, and and really to future proof it. Um, but at this point, uh, the the real constraint, like so many things, is funding and staff. Um, and, and that is the real rate limiting step to, uh, to, to developing them further. And we actually now need to move to a shallow and wide as opposed to the narrow and deep. Um, so I think that is taking one part of the MDT and making sure that that is provided everywhere. Uh, and I think mental health and social work, as, as Lawrence quite rightly says, uh, you know, are the, are the key areas. And those are the areas that we really know are the pressure points going forward. Uh, and just if I may, just a, a, a comment on the, the counsellors and the practice, because I think that is a really, really important comment. And it's one thing that I know that we're agreed on and that we've, we've discussed quite a lot. And that is that the practice isn't necessarily the best place to house a counsellor, uh, particularly with the increased uh, social issues and, so, and, so, and the issues that are coming out of, of COVID and are being increased by COVID. And actually by housing them all and medicalising it almost by putting them in a GP practice creates an artificial barrier to people accessing those services. And um, so to address what we see predominantly coming through our practices, we'd actually much rather those be open access embedded in the community uh, and really patient and population f focused uh, as opposed to putting them under a medical roof and under a, a, a medical barrier. 
Okay, and is is that is that conversation is that conversation live and active between yourselves and the department, or is it this still conceptual? Uh, no, no, no. That is live and active. We we are having uh, those, those discussions, and and very much their focus uh, is is on the mental health side of it as as well. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I want to I want to go then to the issue of access, and and I know that the phone triage system actually predated COVID, but it it almost got overtaken in 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 the public eye by COVID, and it, the two issues got got wrapped up. So I would like to know, do you have an assessment of levels of dissatisfaction with access or is there any way to capture kind of uh, people who are seeking an appointment but don't get it? Is that being reviewed? And is, what type of review is being undertaken by the department in relation to GP services coming out of COVID? So, so in order to restart and resume services, is it being tracked? You know, how many people are seeking an appointment? How many are appropriate? Or, you know, what, what structures and systems are in place to monitor that all? Okay, I, I'll maybe pick up the first part of that and then let Lawrence come in behind because actually one of the, the benefits of COVID is that we have tracked and we have managed, uh, you know, the, the numbers uh, probably better than, than we ever have. Uh, and that's been done through the board and it's been done through practice returns. Uh, so, so we know the numbers that are, are contacting practices and we know the, the conversion rates. And actually the numbers are, are quite astronomical they're astonishing um in that the the consultations at the moment are sitting somewhere between 150 and 160,000 per week uh, there's an additional 10,000 uh, consultations per week uh, in GP out of ours and Lawrence referred to previously that about 30 Three percent, about a third of those are converted to face-to-face -face consultations. So, so just as a headlined figure, that is about eighty patients per thousand uh, that are contacting their GP practice uh, per per week, uh, and that is is an absolutely astonishing number. I mean, that's eight to nine percent of the population, uh, and and that reflects on any number of things related to COVID, uh, be it COVID itself, be it worries, be it concerns about uh, illness or vaccination, uh, but also also all of the other health needs uh, and I think every practice uh, is reporting that uh, that, that is, is increasing rapidly. I'm slightly biased uh, in that we ran uh, as our practice and I think you know this chair that we we've run the the first uh, the phone first system for, for quite a number of years now. Uh, we were one of the, the early adopters with it. And so we have quite a lot of data and we, we still run patient groups and patient satisfaction groups. Uh, so speaking uh, as, a, as a sample, uh, patients, once they get used to it and, and once it beds in, are very, very satisfied with it. Uh, and what you do is you iron out all of the problems. So you can, you can make sure that your access is good. You can make sure that the number of slots for people to phone and to be called back is good. Uh, and very, very importantly, you can manage your time. So I can, if, if I am dealing with 30 phone calls in the morning and I know that there's five people need seen, but it's gonna be a quick look at something, I can allocate them you know, a five, 10 minute appointment. But if I have a complex mental health problem or I've got somebody, an elderly patient with, with uh, complex comorbidities, I can very easily allocate them 20 or 30 minutes and really give them the time. So we shift the system completely uh, to trying to, to put everybody, regardless of what the problem is, into these arbitrary 10 minute appointments to really focus on that, uh, that need. The problem is, so our feedback, uh, once once it becomes established, is very, very good. I can fully understand uh, some of the frustrations and some of the feedback because uh, uh, every other practice has done it so quickly. Uh, and, and I suppose the one learning point is that it does need time and it needs adaption to bed in, to suit, to make sure that it suits, uh, number one, the practice, but actually, most importantly, your patient population. Uh, and, and so, I mean, that is, is one thing. And when you mentioned the, the review by the department, I think we're all agreed and we're, we're engaged in discussions with, with the department about the future model not going back to what it used to be, uh, because I think we, we all know the constraints of what the, the past model was uh, and the difficulty accessing, the difficulty getting uh, appointments on occasions uh, and so on and such like. So it's really building on the, the positives that we're, we're seeing out of this, uh, this new and different model. Oh, yeah, and as, as Alan and, says, and just very briefly, and yeah, yeah, go ahead. 
Go ahead, Lawrence, yes. go ahead. Yeah. And, and so one of the big constraints on it as well was telephone lines, uh, and there was welcome investment from the HSAB for, for additional telephone systems into practices. So, for example, my own practice was able to apply to put in a VOIP system, which, which enabled extra lines going both in and out of the practice, uh, which was vital um, as part of the thing. Uh, also, uh, consideration has been given to giving laptops out to, to practices as well. So, for example, GPs, and again, this happened at my own house, and I'm sure a lot of other GP houses, uh, when a child was sick or with a temperature in a house had to self-isolate uh, for a couple of days. I mean, the GP could work from home uh, doing telephone calls. And again, that was never uh, an option before. Normally, if a GP was sick or if there was a problem, a GP couldn't work from home. So, so hopefully these will all help, help enhance capacity. Okay, thank you. And just briefly, um, in relation to the sort of the education piece, Alan, uh, around the public, uh, is there any plans to kind of... Uh, communicate that out and the benefits of it out and also is patient satisfaction being tracked and, and i do understand that the gps see the advantage of it and, and i think we all everyone can see where the advantages lay is uh, is patient feedback being fed into this uh, system it, it is yeah and, and i think it, i mean that's a very important point to, to bring forward i think that needs to be done better i think once we get out of the the the, the pressures and the panic of of the pandemic and we get a little bit of time i think that's where we need to be meeting with our patient population we need to get that patient feedback and we need to be refining the the system so yeah i, I can speak on, on behalf of my own practice it does need to be done on a wider uh, means but it's it's best done locally because the demand, uh, the pressures, actually the presentations vary very considerably, uh, you know, from area to area, from practice to practice. So, so we would very much encourage that to be those local discussions. Yeah, and the Royal College okay. of GPs has a patient and partnership group, and we intend to meet them in next month uh, to, to get their views about what they feel is the best way to, to serve our patients. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that's that's welcome. I think that co-production and co-design and all of that uh, is is important for all of us. So I, I would welcome that that uh, that that that's happening. Okay. I'm going to go to members. So I have uh, at this point in time, I'm going first of all to our deputy chair Pam Cameron, and then of Cara Hunter, Carol Nichillen, or Leah Flynn, Jonathan Buckley, Jerry Carroll, and Alan Chambers. So that's the order I have at present. So I'll go across then to Pam. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you both, Alan and Lawrence, for your time at committee today. And just to say from the outset, um, um, full appreciation for the, the work that you have, have done, um, and in particular over the past year, which I know has been very difficult. And I know uh, there are many people who will complain about GP access uh, of, as an example, um, but I know and understand the pressures that the GPs have been under and, and understand that actually the numbers of patients that you're dealing with and number of calls have actually increased. So um, just thank you for, for your, your role in that and, and in particular your role within the vaccine rollout. That's very much appreciated. I have a couple of questions for you um, in terms of the first ones around the Access GP and Lawrence, you'd mentioned the, uh, the welcome of the additional investment to put in extra phone lines. Uh, as an example, is there has there been any progression towards um, dedicating maybe a phone line for those patients who maybe don't have access to um, smartphones or good technology in order to, I mean, as an example, and I know I've raised this with you before, I mean, I, I've seen me trying to make an appointment uh, for a GP and having to ring 125 times, but it's literally redial, 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 and it's easy to do with the technology or if you, you're familiar with it. But in terms of patients who have maybe mental health issues or for our older generation who maybe wouldn't be comfortable even with using a mobile phone, for instance, has there been any progression into um, what uh, additional help can be given in order to ensure that they can make um, good contact with GPs when they require it. That's my first one. Yes. So, 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 I mean, the telephone model has been, has been there pre-pandemic as well, uh, and we're, we're very keen to listen to our patients and, and hear about other ways that, that we can that we can get patients to communicate with their practices, uh, so we can you know get their preferences uh, known. Uh, we we certainly do plan to, to do some work with our with our patient group uh, and see see how that shows. The the telephone grant from the HSAB had you know stipulations that we improved uh, connectivity with our care homes and with our community pharmacists. Um, 
but uh, one of the things of uh, and certainly within Alan's practices was was to use digital to help uh, establish where, where what sort of services a patient wanted. So an, an, a, a tool that could help patients indicate that they they want to maybe a form filled. It should be able to be taken out of, you know, out of, out of the, the telephone circulation per se. And again, using different ways such as email uh, would would also help this. But once we get through the pandemic a wee bit more, hopefully we could open our doors a bit more. You know, our reception front desk staff can be a bit more available. But we do look forward to this in the future. And and can I just add to that as well? Because I think you're you're actually touching on a really really important point, Pam. And 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 I don't think the answer to it is is simply telephones and and more lines or or a dedicated line. What you're touching on is is what I was referring to in my introduction is a, a changing model where we move to proactive and a preventative and an anticipatory model. And those those groups of patients that you mention are ones that I think we all know are the most dependent. Um, but yet. We, we all run a reactive service, so we're dependent on them phoning in, telling us that they have a problem, and quite often that's too late. Uh, and so if, if we all know and we all can identify who those most at risk are, um, I think we collectively need to shift to that more proactive model where we're maybe contacting them as opposed to waiting for them to contact us. Now, that's a big, big job for a GP, uh, but that what that actually does is that highlights the need of an expansion and a team that you're, you're able to do that and you're able to provide a, a service such as, as that. But I think that's critical and I think that's a, a vision for the, the future. Thanks for that. Um, and could you also maybe refer to um, the impact the last year has been in, co in comparison to other years in terms of, I don't know if you have any statistics, um, do, are you seeing any downturn or any difference in, for instance, uh, red flag referrals um, made by GPs going onwards. I, I know there is a concern that there will be a lot of misdiagnosis, especially in terms of, of cancer. So do you have any statistics to show any any changes in, in, in those statistics? So, so at the start of the pandemic, that you mean the, the the number of patients coming through our surgeries was was significantly reduced, particularly in the first lockdown between uh, March and June uh, last year. Uh, I'm sure we can provide those statistics, but uh, we are seeing, you know, certainly increased activity, and we would be sure, we would be fairly confident there will be increased cancer diagnosis as a as a result of that increased activity. Yeah, it's, it's an area that really concerns us. We 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 know the figures that we know. I don't have the exact figures to hand, but we know that the referral numbers have gone down and the red flag referrals have, have also gone down. Uh, and that is concerning because we know that the pathology is, is out there. The, the big unknown is, uh, is, is stuff and presentations that just haven't contacted us yet. Um, and uh, and we know that that, uh, that, that is coming. Okay, I appreciate that. And then I wanted to ask around uh, vaccine rollout. Um, uh, could you tell me uh, or update us any more on how you're getting on with uh, reaching those high-spined, clinically extremely vulnerable patients? Or uh, can you tell us if you're if you're seeing much of a reluctance um, to actually receive the vaccine from um, from patients? And, and if you are having that reluctance, um, is there an opportunity to go back to those people then to, to ask again if, if I'm making them aware that they still can access the vaccine? Okay, I'll, I'll pick up on the third uh, point of that uh, first. And, and the answer to that is yes, that's, that's the beauty of general practice. Uh, I think we've I think we've lost your sound there. Can I just check with with Kate Clerk? Yeah, me? we lost you there, Alan. Do you want me to answer there, Chair? Just where this connection is. Yes. Say yes, please do. So, so yeah, Pam, then, I mean, that's a good. That's a good question there, Pam. I mean, our data is 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 astounding for the over 80s who who are more frequently the high spine population, uh, and and to date, I mean, 98 percent of them have been covered with vaccine. Uh, at the start, I mean, our GP district nurses teams were were going out to houses. This scheme is starting to come come to an end, but GPs are flexible, and, and if there are people missed in this group, you I mean GPs will organise for them to get vaccinated either by the GP or the district nurse themselves. So so. 
within the pro program, as Alan was saying, GPs have the flexibility to catch up with people. That's not a problem. Our big constraint, however, is just the supply of the vaccine. Uh, and a lot of patients from different groups, as you can imagine, are contacting our surgeries, and we simply don't have the vaccine to, to administrate to them. But but we will, and, and as soon as it's there, you know, we, we will support them and, and give them their, their shot, as it were. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Stout, maybe if you have access to a headset, it may be better for the sound. So we, we did drop out, but but uh, Dr. Dorman has covered that. So that's that's okay. We'll go then to Kara Hunter. Go ahead, Kara, please. Thank you, Chair. Just took a minute to get unmuted there. Um, thank you both, Dr. Dorman and Dr. Stout, for being here today. Um, recently, I had a meeting um, with the Royal College of GPs, um, but I have a few points here just to raise um, this morning. But again, just to reiterate um, my thanks and just off the back of Pam's comments, we recognise the level of hard work um, the GPs have had over the past year, and you basically had to innovate overnight and change your, your, your protocol and your services. So thank you. Um, one of my questions just refers to uh, regulation and administration, um, just to see what you would like to see being done, if anything, to decrease the amount of administration uh, within your practices, allowing more time for patients. So, so thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, and again, it, it comes back to, to rebuilding our, our, our general practice and, and to looking at, at what we're doing and to use this opportunity to, to rebuild. Uh, the Royal College of GPs has a document there, general practice in the post-COVID world, and we do urge for, for a review of, of unnecessary bureaucracy, which we can then use to, to focus on our patients. Uh, the GPC, I mean, they, they negotiate and, and delegate our contracts. So, I mean, obviously, most of that goes, goes to Alan and his team. Uh, but there's certain, what we would like to focus on is, is quality and outcomes so that we're doing things not for the sake of, of process but doing them because we know that they're actually improving outcomes for patients and they're providing quality for patients yeah and and i'll i'll add to that because it, it is an important point and is one that uh, that affects every practice uh, and there's a difference between what is contractual and non-contractual um and something that attracts almost the simplest definition is something that attracts a fee is non-contractual uh, and, and what practices will do uh, and hopefully we would have the support of the the committee in this is that they will put that somewhere towards the bottom of their priority list because they will focus on dealing with sick people uh, and, and deal with that as a as a secondary uh, sort of thing so so that's an important element first uh, of all there's lots of things within the system as well which are contractual, um, but this is a, a, a long-standing piece of work, which is just making sure that the right people and the most appropriate people are doing the task. Uh, it's actually too easy uh, within the system to say, just go and see your GP and they'll do it. Uh, and that can range from anything from, you know, a prescription that was meant to be issued on, on discharge to a sick line that could have been issued while the patient was, was an inpatient uh, and so on. So there is a little bit of work still to be done within the system to, to just make sure, and that is, is all about making it easy for patients as well uh, that they they get it at the appropriate time from the appropriate person okay thank you it's great to hear firsthand and um, from yourselves about how you're impacted by that and um, my next question refers to um we talked about um briefly in my last meeting with yourselves around recruiting and retaining uh, gps and that statistic that was mentioned there i believe it was 26 percent intend to retire over the next five years so my next question is i just have two um is with regard north south and the registration of gps is there something is this something that's much of an issue um and also uh, is there a lot of red tape around it uh, and in terms of workforce planning what can be done to encourage doctors and those within the medical uh, field such as students uh, to join the field of general practice so I think that's a, a very important question and, and it's something that needs a, a much bigger piece of work where we look at our, our workforce, which is struggling. Uh, so things that we can certainly do is, first of all, look at our current workforce. I mean, is there, is there ways, why is, why is our workforce retiring? Is there opportunities for them, you know, to keep them in the profession or keep, you know, some role for them? Uh, and also how we attract new people into the profession. So there's 111 training places and this year for the first time, they're, they're oversubscribed by about two to one. So we do feel that that needs, needs reviewed in a full comprehensive manner. Uh, you're quite right about, about north-south working and so on. So at the moment, if, it, if a, a doctor does their GP training in the Republic of Ireland, it is very slow and cumbersome for them to, to then 
take their their skills and bring them up to Northern Ireland because there has to be uh, recognition of that training. But we would urge the department to invest. It would only take a little bit of funding, uh, a little bit of scrutiny, about how we could ensure that those GPs can can take their skills and come back to Northern Ireland. Because being mindful that many of these GPs have, have, have originally come from Northern Ireland, they've maybe gone down to, to universities down in, down in the Republic of Ireland. So, so how we can encourage them to, to come back home, because many of them do want to come home and bring their families up here. And and just uh, just within what Lawrence was saying, there's a really important positive there. Uh, the the previous health minister had, had announced and had increased the the training numbers to 111. And actually, for a couple of years, we struggled to fill those places. We now can fill many more than that, and we have a service that we know if we're going to do the right thing, we know that it's going to focus on primary and community care, it's going to be out of hospital care, it's going to focus on that proactive and preventative management and so on. So we need people there uh, and we need the staff there. And uh, and so the, the 111, now that we know that we can fill those, we actually need to go, uh, go beyond that, above and beyond that, and make sure that we have a, a workforce that is fit for the future. Absolutely. Look, thank you both for being here. That's me. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'm going then to Carol McKillen. Go ahead, Carol, please. So thank you, um, Dr. Stornan and Stout, for this morning. It's been very, very informative. Um, so the, the issue around the, the dual registration cuts right across um, the health and social care piece. So it, it does impact on GPs, but it is an issue that we'll be certainly keeping an eye on with the department. So just to give you that assurance, um, I mean, given the fact that this is a small island and people have trained one place and grew up in another, um, and you, as you will know, it's a, an ongoing process about learning and acquiring new skills, um, and that enhances your employability. So it is really important that just to let you know that we will be keeping an eye on that. The, the question I have is in relation to appraisals, um, and indeed, um, you know, I know you will accept that appraisals of GPs are very, very important. So I am not uh, suggesting that cutting down on unnecessary bureaucracy would be linked to appraisals, but how can appraisals for GPs, individual GPs, be better enhanced? And then my next question would be around, so for example, I know you will have a contract with the Department of Health, but does each GP have each doctor and each medical professional within those practices have a, an employment contract as well? Um, because that's, you know, very, very important. And then my last question is, uh, you did mention the fact that you, you respect and rely on community colleagues, particularly around talking therapies. I just want to know what concerns, if any, you've had that recent contracts in Belfast have been reduced in terms of talking therapy hubs? And I know a lot of GPs rely on the community and voluntary sector. So I'm just wondering, you know, what support can be given to those? I know my colleague, Orlea Flynn, has majored in this, but I, I've just dealt with groups in North Belfast within the last few days, and I am quite concerned because I know a number of our local GPs rely on them. So that's my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now uh, do you want me to start, Lawrence, or? Yeah, you start. Go. I'll start on this one, yeah. Okay. I mean, both, both Lawrence and myself are, are actually uh, minorly conflicted on your first question on appraisals because we've both been integrally involved in, in appraisals. But actually, the first two fun, uh, comments or questions uh, actually highlight something that we do better here. Uh, and, and our appraisals in, uh, in, in the North are actually... We've managed to maintain them as being formative and peer review, uh, as opposed to, uh, particularly in England, where they've become much more um, of, a, of an examination uh, type of thing uh, on an annual basis. Um, and that is really, really important. And, and actually, the feedback that we get from, from the, the vast majority of GPs is that they really value that uh, as an annual event. You're right, it, it is something else that just takes up a little bit of of precious time um, but so long as we can keep it as a formative process and we can keep it as a peer review 
and particularly now with the stress that people have gone under. So they were suspended over the last year. And then we've actually had some, because of the pressures and because of the lack of face-to-face -face and everything else. Uh, and actually some of the feedback has been that, that people would have valued it in the last year more than, than ever. And just the ability to have a conversation with a peer and, and to, uh, to, to discuss some issues and, and problems and so on. Um, so it, it, is a, it is a valuable part of, of, of what we do. And, and I think in fairness, we have kept that quite well. In terms of the question on the contract, um, we yeah, we do have a, you have a practice contract, but then within the the practice, uh, your practice is actually a partnership. It runs as a small business effectively, um, so you have a partnership agreement as opposed to individual, um, uh, you know, contracts for for each doctor. Um, a lot of practices now will take on a salaried GP, uh, and quite often that is by choice uh, of the individual. Vigil GP um, that uh, that they prefer, and certainly in early years they prefer to take a salaried uh, position, and there is a model contract for that, so they will be contracted. But the positive in amongst that is completely against the grain of of the three other uh, nations. Uh, we have seen an increase in doctors working in practice, be it either through as a partner, as a salaried, as a retainer uh, of of twelve percent. Uh, amazingly, so that that actual model of the practice. Uh, and uh, and of that as a partnership uh, is actually stronger here than it is uh, anywhere else, which can can only be a good thing. And then finally, just on the talking therapies uh, and the access, you're, you're absolutely right. What we are seeing uh, is is a difficulty accessing. We're seeing a longer wait, um, you know, for for accessing uh, any number uh, of of those services. And and I mean, I am a, a massive fan, a massive admirer of, of what the community and voluntary sector do and provide. Um, and and I, I mean, that is a, another conversation in itself about how we sustain their services and we change the agreement and the funding and, and the, the commitments that we, we give to them because they provide such a vital service. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think we, we need to be collectively looking at enhancing and, and strength, strengthening that uh, as, as such a vital part of, of all of our work. So, so as Alan says, I mean, both he and I are GP appraisers, and, and, and each GP has to do do an annual appraisal each year. But but it's it's formative; it's not summative, so it's not something you pass or fail. But but having it written in stone that you have to do it once a year forces forces us uh, to look at our education to make sure that we're keeping up to date, you know, and that our skills are honed. It also proves a very vital task whenever you know we can sit and talk to a colleague about things that are maybe difficult to talk about, such as mental stress and health. Uh, and a big thing that I mean, the College of GPs would be keen. Is that, is, that, is that there could be more opportunities as a result of this for GPs who are having issues with, with mental health issues or potentially addiction issues. Um, those two issues particularly are very difficult for GPs and, and, hospital, and doctors in general uh, to bring forward to the fore. So it would be very important that we had an avenue where we could explore these because if, if a, a GP, for example, has an issue with mental health problems or, or addiction problems, those are embarrassing problems. And it'd be very sort of tricky for them to go and see their own their own GP, as it were, who who's another colleague. So. So anything that can be done to support that, and the end to echo Alan's thing uh, about about talking therapies, we, we really need as much access as possible to talking therapies. It's a vital part of how we care for our patients. Okay, thank you. Okay, Carol. Yeah, thank, thank you. you okay, thank okay, thank thank you, thank you, Carol, and thank you, uh, doctors. Going then to Orlea Flynn. Go ahead, Orlea, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Alan and um, Lawrence. Um, I just want to say, Lawrence, know that you were involved at yesterday's um, the NA Policy Forum um, conference, and you spoke really well on all of those issues um, around mental health and, and the, the GP practices and obviously the pressures that the users are coming under and facing in different constituencies as well um, on these issues. And hopefully the 10-year strategy we can work towards improving um, the overall picture of, of, of mental health, hopefully. But just maybe to bring it back to, because um, Alan, I know that you have commented there in response to Carl, just around that issue of the talking therapies. And and so we know that there is additional pressures there and that there there is longer waits. Um, and it, it's sort of bringing it back to the issue around the, the local enhanced um, services and the in-house counselling and GP practices. And I know in your opening statement, Alan, you had mentioned that, you know, practices um, may not necessarily be the best place for locating counsellors. 
and I, I would just be interested to know because I mean you know I, I completely agree whenever a practice maybe hasn't got you know the physical space um to facilitate that but I, I'm, I'm speaking maybe from a West Belfast perspective here also um you know the the you know, if your view is that it's it's preferable that, that those services are based within the community and voluntary sector, there's no argument against that. And I know certainly in West Belfast, um, we have a really um, thriving community and voluntary sector in the, the context of mental health and suicide prevention. They're doing a wonderful job. But with all that said, because the level of need is so great, particularly in the constituency of West Belfast, North Belfast, parts of Derry and others, um, I don't think it's a case of either or. Um, and I think where we have the talking, um, where we have the talking therapies in place, I think we should also have that local enhanced service if it is available. So um, I know that there has been a lobby, a massive lobby um, from constituents within the West Belfast constituency, um, asking and requesting that we have these services. And when we're talking about, you know, increasing inequalities in terms of the MDTs, and that is a danger, and you have to do everything you can to prevent that. At the minute, there is an inequality whenever it comes to um, in-house counselling and GP surgeries. It is there is a postcode lottery um, at the minute. The way that the nature of access um, to counselling is at present. So the Health and Social Care Board, um, just to finish off, did say to the Suicide Prevention All Party Group. It was last year, January 2020, that they are committed to providing additional supports to GP practices. That they send out the, the annual letter at the start of every financial year. To, ask GP practices if they're interested in um, in acquiring an additional service, which could include the in-house counselling. And they also do then the three-year cycle visits with health and social care uh, board officers that go out to the practices. And I'm just wondering, I mean, with all that said, um, would you be in agreement that this is what we should and try, uh, we should try to, to work towards given? I mean, it's been talked about uh, numerous times this morning repeatedly at the conference yesterday around the, the mental health needs in different constituencies. Um, uh, so we know it's an issue. So, you know, with all that said, if the board is given GP surgeries the support that you need, um, you know, do you think that there would be any pushback or could we move into that space where we're basically trying to do basically everything that we can, including the, the, the talking therapies, but also the, the in-house counselling? Yeah, and you, I mean you're you're absolutely right. I agree with what you say 100. percent And and just to, to 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 be absolutely clear, I wasn't talking about uh, the the community based services uh, instead of uh, the practice based services. I, I agree with you. I mean this is about more. It's not about either or. It's about early and easy access. Uh, you know, which can pick problems up and solve problems very, very quickly before it needs escalation. But then it's about the escalation uh, whenever it's required, and that can be through the practice services, and it can be beyond to, to you know, to to MDT-based services, uh, you know, or to to hospital-based services as required. So it's about streamlining that whole process. But uh, but yeah, I think 100% agree. I think we're saying the same thing. This is about capturing the problems. At as early a possible stage, uh, and trying to prevent uh, prevent the, the worsening and the escalation, uh, and that's where we're going to be most successful. Okay, thank you, Alan. And maybe just finally and quickly, um, Lawrence, you had mentioned there in the context of you know GPs and you know the pressure that they're under and some of their own suffering um, down to the, the stress that they've been under. And a question I would be interested to know at the minute. Um, I know that myself and Carl again in the constituencies that we're totally proud to represent. But the amount of cases that we are dealing with around um, a lack of dual diagnosis service and people that are in uh, with mental health problems, illnesses, and also battling addictions, it just seems to be the issue seems to be becoming a lot worse in my view. Um, that I can just see the level of need personally with the, the cases I'm even dealing with this week. It's horrendous and it's heartbreaking. And I'm just interested to know maybe your own views. Are you picking up the same problems in yeah in your surgeries and know that hopefully we're going to get this into the mental health strategy and try and get statutory services working more closely together. But are you are you picking up the same the same concerns? Very much, and we fit back to the mental health strategy as well. Exactly those things, and it's very difficult when you have somebody who has, for example, an addiction problem and it precludes them nearly from from another part of the service, uh, and, and we need to work better for that. So.
uh, if you take, I mean, the MDT model again just offers us so much better opportunities to treat people with with things like like addiction problems. So historically, I mean. Say, say four years ago, if I had a patient with addiction problems, I had to refer him to the trust. I work in Kilkeel. They would get a first appointment in potentially Craig Avon or Armagh, which is two bus journeys from Kilkeel. If you're struggling on £60 a week, you're not going to go. Whereas now, uh, our mental health worker in practice, she phones them directly. She uses the community addiction services that are already in her area. She follows them up afterwards. It's just a better way of, of doing these things. But again, the close link between mental health and addiction, it, it's true. It, they just can't preclude one from one service. Yeah, and and just to, just to elaborate on on that just very briefly as well, because we we've, we've been talking about health inequalities, and and I think we need to be very clear that the biggest factor in health inequalities uh, is the deaths of despair, uh, which are mental health related, they're drug and alcohol related, they're violence related, and they're social uh, issue relate related as well. Um, we focus far too much on measuring blood pressures and cholesterol, so those are are important. Um, but we, if we're going to properly tackle health inequalities. We need to be really focusing, uh, you know, on, on those areas and, and what we know is creating those uh, those major major problems. Thank you so much, and you have my full yeah. support in in extending the MDTs to try, try and help support the the great work that you are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's a really really important point that 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 you finished up with there, Orlea and Alan. Um, and we heard from from Siobhan O'Neill last week, the mental health champion, of the impact of transgenerational traumas that are that are arising as a result of these untreated or unaddressed issues. And we're building up for the problem. So if we can get in there proactively and quickly and before the crisis uh, has has erupted, in a sense. That's 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 something that we need absolutely must get to. So uh, I'm going then the, the following members. Then I have an order. I'm going to Jonathan next, then Jerry, then Alan, and then Paula. So Jonathan Buckley, go ahead there, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Dr. Dorman and Dr. Stout. Um, I suppose probably first of all, can I say it's very important that we have an honest conversation as to the accessibility of GP services, particularly throughout COVID nineteen. And I think accessibility was something that was on the lips of many of our constituents throughout the pandemic, particularly in the beginning when there was a lot of disinformation, uh, there was a lot of fear as to what the service would look like. But it is without doubt that there was a disparity across the country. And I, I, I say that in terms of uh, a patient's um, treatment or patient's uh, pathway in Kilkeel would have been very different to maybe say for example somebody within Portadown and I even say that within practices that there was a disparity and I look at it in particular if we look at the telephone triage and consultant as has been outlined uh, the blended approach you know I, I've been talking to a GP who told me that even within his own practice when he carries out that internal uh, audit as to the conversion rate or ratio between uh, telephone triage, which leading to face-to-face -face appointments, it, it differs even within a, a GP setting as opposed to what it may look like across the country. And I think that is something that we as politicians are really going to have to get a grip of as to how we can ensure accountability within the system. And I would be interested to hear your thoughts about how that could be achieved. Uh, if we are firmly bedded on a blended approach, which yes, was does predate COVID, I accept that, but has certainly accelerated with COVID. Um, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on how we as elected representatives can ensure accountability across the board to ensure that patients, whether that be in whatever stretch of Northern Ireland they come from, uh, receive adequate care when they need it. Okay. You, you, you're touching on my possibly my favourite subject, um, and and actually, I, I would use rather than the word disparity, I would use variance. And variance is actually one thing that is is pro possibly and probably the biggest challenge right throughout the health service, and that is that everybody does things slightly differently. So we're we're focusing on variance, and, and as you're describing, we're focusing on variance in terms of accessing GP services. But variance has always uh, been there within practices and and within every single part of the health service. So in other words, Lawrence and myself will prescribe slightly differently. We'll have a slightly different threshold for referral 
general, depending on our experience and depending on whether we've maybe been sued over a similar case before, depending on the pressure, whether we've got two partners off and we just can't cope. Um, and we'll also have a variance in terms of, of whether somebody will, will go to ED or not, or whether they'll contact the practice. So we have variance right throughout the system. And, and actually what you've, you've strangely done is you've answered your own question because the way that you do address that is accountability. Um, and, and that's where we, we have to be comfortable within the system that we start to move to an accountability. Because again, using Lawrence and myself as, as an example, uh, and any other clinician or any other healthcare worker is responsible for what we do, but we're not accountable for what we do. Um, so in other words, we could treat you for the same condition with a drug that would work just as well, each drug would work each, both as well. This is a very silly example, um, but one might cost 10 times the other. Uh, but we're both clinically responsible for what we've done and what we've prescribed, but we're not actually accountable at any point of what that costs. Somebody will come and we'll get a prescribing visit and they'll tell us that we're spending far too much on our drug budget. But equally, if I refer somebody to, to a hospital clinic, I'm not accountable for everything that happens and the price of that appointment and the price of the scan and everything else. Whereas if we introduced a, 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 an element and a stronger element of accountability, which meant that we made sure that patients were seen in the most effective, the quickest uh, manner and by the right person at the right time. The difficulty, one of the big difficulties that we have in the system at the moment is we have a system that is set up and, and this is where uh, the MA folk uh, always cover their ears, but we have a, a, a system that's set up to suit doctors and not patients. But we've also a system that is set up to generate waiting lists and um, so in other words we put we once we make a decision we just send everybody to the same place and we put them on a waiting list whereas there is a multitude of other ways to deal uh, with uh, with some of those patients uh, and if you introduce an accountability that creates the best possible system the best possible service for those patients we end up looking like a completely different service so it, as i suppose in conclusion I'm, I'm i'm kind of agreeing with you but i think it needs to go way beyond uh, you know what we're describing sim simply in terms of, of gp access um you know uh, but gp access and enhancing primary care access to a whole multitude of services uh, to benefit our patients is is got to be critical to our future model and, and highlight to that as well is the importance of GP data. So the pandemic, I mean, as we've heard there, has started to show from the board, you mean GP data about the face-to-face the -face ratio and so on. We've never really had that before, and it's still in its very early stages. So uh, GP data is recorded and housed in a place called the GP Information Platform, GPIP, uh, and there's huge opportunities for that with a small amount of investment. That data could be used in GP surgeries. I, as a GP, could have that on a dashboard on my desk, and it could it could help highlight things, you know, that, that will help influence you know and help improve practice performance yeah no i think that's a very very interesting element of this which i think covid can help with i believe it or not is in terms of uh, the the amount of physical data that, that we have within the system and I, I had an interesting conversation actually with rqia who talked about moving towards a much more data focused approach and indeed sort of like in very broad terms like scorecards for example essentially for care homes publicly uh, uh, accessible to the general public to assess where individual care homes are and that's suppose probably what I think the public deserve in relation to GP services they do have a right to know uh, uh, how individual uh, practices are, are performing in relation to um, waiting times I think we can all accept that it's not acceptable to see patients ringing whether it's 100 times 150 times or whatever uh, I think we do need to really get a grip of how we um, streamline that model to ensure that everybody has adequate access um, Dr. Stout you led on and I'm not sure if he's frozen on the screen or he's just very, holding his pose brief, quite well brief, but uh, please, I'll continue very brief question yeah. please John. we did go on to talk about uh, we, waiting lists in general uh, and it's today it was announced that northern ireland has missed every cancer target that there is something that's very sad and alarming to us as committee members how concerned are you about waiting lists in relation to referrals uh, from gps to 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 other parts of the health system 
Yeah, I mean, every every GP is is massively concerned about that, not, not only because of the care of our patients and the effective care of our patients and making sure that they're they're treated uh, quickly and appropriately, but uh, but also because of the impact on us as, as GPs. So the longer somebody uh, waits on a waiting list, that is generating uh, an infinite number of more contacts with ourselves and the work that follows that and us trying to chase the appointment and, and, uh, and various other things. So, uh, I mean, it really does impact on, on the whole service and again that comes down to accountability the longer somebody is on a waiting list the more disrupting our system as a whole because of that increased level of prescribing that increased level of contacts potential ed attendance as they potentially convert from an urgent case to an emergency case and all of all of what that entails so it has to be we have to change the system to a refined system that gets the right person seen in the right place at the right time we're we're, we're a million miles from that uh, and simply putting any sort of sticking plaster over over our current system and our current way of, of dealing with elective care uh, is not going to work. It's not a sustainable solution. We have to completely uh, change it. We have to completely redesign it uh, and get something that is uh, is much much safer uh, and much more effective for our patients. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm going then to Jerry. Carol, Jerry, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Lawrence and Alan. I thank Lawrence and Judy Meet yourself for the Royal College tomorrow. So I'll try not to be too long. Maybe I'll ask more questions tomorrow. Uh, I just want to hone in uh, on the, the mental health um, services that, that, that um, uh, Carl and, and uh, Orlea and, and, and Carl, I think, touched a bit and uh, talked about. I want to expand upon it a bit because, you know, I, I think um, with, with with respect, I think we're being told, obviously, um, you know, I think uh, was it was Alan's comments about, you know, GP isn't the, the ideal place to, to sort of look after people or, or give them services, which, you know, May or may not be true, um, but also I think you know MDTs are, are being rolled out, but you know not at a quick enough pace, uh, and, and I'm concerned that um, you know caught in the middle between you know what could be a, the best case scenario for people to be seen in terms of the best setting, um, you know there's going to be a period of, of years passing by where people are, are falling through the cracks, uh, and to be blunt and, and frank, I think you know people who are you know suffering from depression, anxiety, or, or, or mental health or mental illness. Uh, probably wouldn't really care if it's an MDT or a community counsellor or whomever. But the problem is, you know, MDTs aren't rolling out quick enough. Uh, community uh, counselling is a fantastic service, but as we've heard, it's, it's been underfunded, it's losing funding, the funding isn't increasing. So I'm concerned in the context that we have, even pre-COVID, there wasn't enough resources to uh, support people with the possible uh, increase and I am there's possible increase in mental health uh, problems after COVID that people will be will be lost uh, in that context so um, that's a few thoughts and I suppose my question is around uh, GP services and the, and the 50% as, as uh, our layer column uh, talked about 50% of GPs in West Belfast have no uh, mental health services in-house and that's no reflection on them uh, as GPs, but it's a it's a reality, it's a it's a fact, uh, and I think that it's it's a problem in, in all sorts of ways. And it also I think feeds into that thing that mental health is somehow different from other uh, health uh, issues. In some ways it is, but also there's a, there's still a stigma attached to it. So um, yeah, a kind of a, a comment on that to say that it is the the obstacle. Uh, the GPs that um, there isn't enough support in its size of GP practices or, or what is your assessment um, uh, Alan and Lawrence why there isn't a 100% or, or close to 100% uh, of uh, mental health services in house, in -house counselling at uh, GPs uh, that would be great thanks so yeah, so I'll come in on that. So so there's a couple of things with that. I mean, and the MDT model gives us gives us a huge thing. One thing I would say is to encourage our patients who who do have an MDT in their area is is to to be able to be proactive and book the the appointment directly. So unfortunately, we are trying to move a, tr a transition to get the patients away from the, the GP has to do everything model to a, I have mental health and if I phone my practice, I can ask for a mental. Health health worker, which is really important. Uh, the in-house counselling is, is a tricky one, okay, and, and both Alan and myself, we want really good, quick access to counselling services. That's that's vital for all GPs across the country, but sometimes it doesn't sit best inside the, inside the practice house, as it were, you know, I mean, if you imagine it as a building. So the current model with the LES 
it, it offers a certain amount of money for a practice to employ a, a mental health worker who sits inside the building, whether the building is small or large, uh, to, you know, to, to do that, that work for one year. But my own experience in my own practice, we've had an in-house practice this counselor for years she's absolutely fantastic and she's worked really well for for my particular practice but right at the very start for the first three years we had too many patients for the budget that was allocated so you're already into into difficulties with that and then you know are you going to then start turning people away whenever you go through that budget uh the, the issues of its extra practice workload to employ and recruit and, and maintain members of staff. Uh, and then we know that mental health workers, I mean, there's going to be a, you know, a drain, you know, with all sort of uh, recruitment. So so there are huge bits around it, but whether we could come to a better a better way of working where we work together. So the federations offer us opportunities where we work at scale. So the federations, for example, West Bel Belfast Federation could work at scale to do sort of the, the paperwork, the administration jobs, but still allowing practices to have easy contact with, with a, 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 um, a mental health worker. Okay, thanks. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue this tomorrow, Lawrence. Just, just one, right, one quick question, a follow-up, a uh, different one, sure. Um, Cara touched upon sort of um, uh, the amount of GPs and, uh, and training and recruiting and, and retention. And in, in terms of, um, I think, Alan, you were briefing us maybe last year or, or whatever, <laughs> however long ago it was, about the uh, Berhera population GPs. I think we're lower than, than other regions in, in the south and the UK. Um, is there scope uh, and is there work to be done in terms of universities either uh, allowing more GP or people in the um, uh, in the study of medicine, possibly changing the grades because when I was studying many, many years ago, I think it was three A's uh, or, or maybe two A stars and an A uh, in the medicine, something that I was unable to obviously uh, get myself. But is there, is there scope for work to be done in terms of more people studying medicine uh, and possibly altering changing the, the grades so more people can uh, get into um, medicine? So an answer on that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're you're absolutely right, Jerry. It goes right across. It goes right to schools. It goes to the grades, the entry criteria to uh, to get into medical school. It then goes into medical school and the exposure to general practice in in medical school as well. So we're attracting students at an early stage, uh, and we've started to see a change in that. Uh, and then it's about then once you leave medical school and you become a doctor, it's then about the accessibility to training places, uh, the exposure through your early years of training as well before people will have made a decision as to what they want to do uh, you know so that they can uh, see and even if they do go on to a, to another specialty uh, we I think both Lawrence and I are, are both fully agreed on this is that the exposure to general practice is so important to every single doctor um, you know so that, uh, so that everybody understands the, the system uh, and understands the pressures. Yeah, and as Alan says, I mean, the, well, what general practice gives students is is what we call generalist education. So, health education in England has has recommended that that we need to train doctors with good generalist skills. So, they they know a bit about all the bits of the system, and they have good sort of whole person skills. And that's vital that we can do that, and then inspire people to becoming GPs. Uh, when Alan and I went to medical school, general practice wasn't, wasn't given maybe the the, the kudos and, and the respect that it should, but it's now been seen really very much so, uh, you know, as a challenging and, and, and rewarding career. And there are increased capacity and issues with, with training. So we've just got the, the welcome announcement for the new graduate medical school up in Derry. Uh, Queen's University are taking more places there. I think recently there's been an extra 80 places. And again, the Queen's University curriculum has changed now. So the new curriculum C25 has changed. So 25% of Queen's medical students will come through general practice. But that puts more precious pressure back on our premises. So we are going to need bigger, bigger buildings uh, with all these people coming through our through our doors. Uh, and it's, it's vital that that could be work through but also taken into account with a bigger strategy. So if that could be taken into account with the MDT planning, it'll mean and back to this sort of pathway rolling out, if we can plan that so that not only we're making, if we're needing to create bigger rooms for MDTs, but also with medical students and training in mind, that would be really appropriate. Thank you. Thanks, your answers. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, going then to Alan Chambers. Um, go ahead, Alan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, doctors. And I, I would like to add my appreciation and congratulations to how GP practices have dealt with both the flu and the COVID vaccinating programs and whilst maintaining a GP service. So well done there. Um, necessity sometimes is a motivator for change. And I'm just wondering, have you found any positives uh, during this uh, pandemic of 
of maybe better ways, more efficient ways of doing things within your practice? Uh, and will you be maybe reviewing those at the end of this uh, pandemic and, and bringing the, uh, these better ways maybe of doing things uh, into practice? Uh, the other thing is um, there, there is a degree of public concern uh, around, uh, you know, the, the, the moving to the, the, the virtual consultations. And are you reasonably confident that, that vital uh, diagnoses will not be missed? Um, you know, particularly with patients that maybe talk down their symptoms. Uh, so is there a challenge there? Uh, and my last question, doctors, would be around, uh, and excuse me if, if it has already been asked because I, I dropped out of the meeting there for a short while, but long COVID, I'm just wondering, uh, doctors, um, are you finding many people, patients presenting with this? Uh, how, do you, how are you currently dealing with patients that present with it? And what do you think are the long-term uh, solutions to address this, uh, this growing problem? Thank you. So th those are, are very good questions. Oh, and, yeah. and again, do you want me to start there, sorry? Is that okay, uh, the, the, so, so, so some yeah. of the better ways of working from my own practice, I mean, the, there's too many of them to say, but well, one of the simple ones was the e emailing uh, health certificates for patients has been a quick way. So instead of patients having to drive all the way into the surgery, we've been able to email them, which has been really helpful. The telephone goes without saying. And again, the, the connection with our community pharmacy colleagues has just been brilliant. You, you, you raise an important topic about missing vital diagnosis. And again, I mean, I reiterated, I've reiterated a, a, a lot of times is that if patients have any concerns about any worrying or cancer, potential cancer symptoms, they must get in touch with us. I mean, we will continue to do that. Patients do sometimes talk down their symptoms. And, and again, we, we're really keen that, that, that they don't and that if they have a concern, they come and see us. The, the telephone consultation, it's still a consultation. We're still taking, you know, detailed notes about a patient when we're doing. We're still acting, asking very pertinent questions the same way we would do as if they were in the room. So we, we're, we're confident that there is huge amounts of safety with that. But sure, and whenever we do feel that, that we do need to see people, we will see them face to face. And it's important that patients always know that that if the consultation isn't going the way they would like, they can say at the end, "Look, can we arrange for it coming in?" I just I'm, I'm not quite happy about something. Long COVID is is very important, uh, and the Royal College of GPs, along with NICE and the Scottish Intermediate uh, Care Guidelines, have issued guidance on 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 long COVID and and on how we feel it should be both defined, diagnosed, and the services required to put in for it. Uh, GPs are going to need uh, you know, access to interventions to make sure that we don't miss anything if some, somebody has symptoms of long COVID. So if it's persistent shortness of breath, persistent headache, that, that we have access to those appropriate investigations so we don't miss anything, like you say. And then after that, we need to work in collaboration with our hospital colleagues that if a patient has the symptoms of long COVID, that we know exactly what pathway they need to, to identify and where that needs to go. Because sometimes the symptoms of long COVID can be can be different and can cross departments. So, for example, one of the symptoms is brain fog. Patients complain about which does that go just to a long COVID clinic? Does it go to a neurology clinic versus somebody who's complaining of shortness of breath? Does that go to a respiratory clinic? So, it's very important we work with our hospital colleagues to, to clarify those issues. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Alan. And uh, finally, then from members, we're going to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for coming along this morning. Um, thank you for your work, but I would also like to pay um, particular gratitude to the policy officers in your both your organisations. Their contributions during the last year have been really, really valuable in terms of getting information out to constituents. Um, my first question is in relation to those lesser known conditions that people will present at GB practices about. For example, this week, Colm and I met with um, a group of ladies who were experiencing problems with endometriosis, and they talked about how many times they turn up to their GP practice, and then um, they feel that in some ways their GP doesn't understand, so then they end up in, in uh, emergency departments. And I'm conscious that there's a, you know, there's a number of conditions like ME or Huntington's disease, where um, GPs are not should not be expected to be across all the details. So I'm just wondering how going forward, um, will we sort of reconfigure and transform our health service? Can we better um, support patients when they present with conditions that are not so well known to GPs? Thank you. 
so do you, mind, do you mind if I start with this one? Alan? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so for, first, thank you so much, Paula, for, for your comments about our policy officers. I mean, Alan and I both are, are totally reliant on fabulous teams behind us. And today actually happens to be the last day of our own policy officer, Claire Higgins. So we wish her very much the, the best in her new job at the Department of Health. Uh, endometriosis has been very difficult. And some of, I mean, I've had... Uh, patients over the years who've been suffering from this debilitating and terrible condition who've been sitting on w hospital waiting lists for years for surgery and as Alan said earlier these are patients that come back to us to look to us to give pain medication and quite frequently the pain medication gets to levels that becomes dangerous it's just not in their interests. So, so ways of, of addressing that are, as Alan was outlining about how we overhaul the whole system, but also how we communicate better with our secondary care colleagues and how we facilitate that. So I have a clear way of, of speaking to my hospital colleague and say, look, I have a patient on your waiting list. Things are really getting bad. Can, can, we, can we change this? You're right about uh, conditions, in particular rare diseases. So, so there is a, 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 a federation called the Rare Disease Partnership, uh, and it has a very powerful motto which says rare diseases are rare, but patients with rare diseases are quite common. Uh, and on what your, your, your examples of particularly conditions like ME and Huntington's and so on, and things that don't fit into niche boxes, boxes highlight again the importance of the generalist, and it highlights the importance of generalist medica medical education, and highlights the importance of having good GPs in our community with our whole healthcare. Okay, thank you. And the second one is really about. Sorry, um, is, is... I was just going to add very briefly to what Lawrence had said because it is an important, and it touches on on one of our previous answers as well, and that is just variance. So, I mean, you take something like like endometriosis, and and actually, it's a good example because what we've done is we've set up the federations, so the groups of practices working together. We have a gynae lead, for example, a GP gynae lead who will deal with with things. So, Every GP and and is is very proud to be a generalist, but we have small numbers of GPs who are more expert in some conditions than than others. Uh, and rather than everything becoming a referral, which historically it has been, there is a way to access you know those one or two GPs that know a little bit more about gynae or a little bit more about neurology or a little bit more about cardiology uh, that can deal with them within the primary care environment without it becoming a referral. So that becomes a big big part of the future model of elective care uh, as well uh, and just trying to manage that variance and try and keep things in primary care and manage to their absolute optimum within primary care as much as we can. And thank you. And I'm just going to move on then to referrals into secondary care. And I, I only discovered recently on behalf of a constituent that, for example, you can direct refer into sensory. You know, if you've got tinnitus, for example, um, which obviously cut out the need to go through the GP. And I'm just wondering to what degree you think that it would be beneficial to GP practices if there was more direct referral, self-referral into um, uh, those sort of specialist services within our hospitals. So I think that's a, fa a fantastic idea. And, and just in the past year in the Southern Trust, the direct referral physiotherapy route has just opened. And this is fantastic. You mean a, a patient who needs physiotherapy for, for a, a straightforward low back condition, for example, doesn't need to come and make an appointment with me for me then to write a letter to just take you. I mean, it's, it's all about efficiency. So very much welcome that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and I agree entirely. I mean, our system is, is too full of having five contacts with five different people to get the outcome to the end person that we all knew that they needed to get to um, and, and the patient themselves knew that they needed to get to. So you're, you're right. I mean, doing it, 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 it does, it's not actually an answer for absolutely everything, but, uh, but it certainly has a, a significant place uh, in a large number of areas. Thank you, gentlemen. And I suppose just off the back of that, I, I only stumbled across it because the Belfast Health Trust actually sent us out a weekly bulletin now to, to, um, to, to sort of tell us about different services. So I suppose there's a communication for us as well so that we are not telling people just present at your GP. So I suppose everything always comes back to communication. But thanks again for this morning and all your work. Yep. OK, thank you. Thank you, Paula. And uh... I suppose that there has been an interesting kind of strand or thread throughout that in, in relation to the issue of variance and variance, I suppose, can uh, either lead to increased disparity or actually could be used to address disparity. I suppose that's that's the key message that, that we need to look at how we can kind of uh, mobilize that. 
But um, for this morning, I just want to thank you both for your attendance here this morning, for your comprehensive uh, addressing of, of members' questions, and also to reiterate members' comments there in relation to the entire GP workforce, our thanks and our acknowledgement of the, the massive amount of work, the massive amount of changes, and the massive amount of contribution that they have played uh, during COVID. Um, I suppose we are we have all engaged with, with both of yourselves on a regular basis prior to COVID around the wider issues of GP, around young GPs not necessarily wanting to enter into business arrangements, around the ver- the, the kind of a uh, the variability of the work that in order to help retention and recruitment, some GPs would like to be doing other bits of work, work life balance. All of those issues, I think, which are so key to retention and recruitment and support and just morale. And I think we're all looking forward to to getting back to trying to address some of those issues while also acknowledging there is some progress uh, being made across some of those areas. Um, from my own point of view, from a rural constituency here like that, in that west of the ban, the provision of GP services is a particular concern but also something that we, we hugely value. And I do indeed welcome the, the McGee Medical School and other Graduate entry, I think, will also be a big help to to allowing people to step forward into or step uh, progress into into general practice. So those are all huge issues. But uh, for today, I want to thank you for your attendance, and I'm sure we will see you again and look forward to seeing you again and, and picking up on many of these issues. But for now, good luck and thank you, Dr. Stout and Dr. Darman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members, any any comments there um, in relation to that? I uh, thought a very useful session. Um, any any comments or any anything from members? No. Um, good, Carol, go ahead. Sorry, um, I, d- I didn't want to go back and ask a question, but one of the concerns, particularly around appraisals, um, and as soon as both Dr. Lord and Alan said they were slightly conflicted, I didn't want to put them on the spot. But they also mentioned their presentation about the number of antidepressants and heavy, you know, drugs being prescribed in certain areas. And I would hazard a guess it's mostly in areas of deprivation. I would like a bit more in-depth analysis from them around why this is a case and what alternatives they're trying to bring forward, as well as um, supporting people who need medication, particularly for mental health. Um, and ask, is that built in, that level of prescribing, is that built in to the appraisal process? Um, I just felt a wee bit hamstrung when they declared that they had a slight conflict of interest. So I'd like to chase that up, Chair. Yeah, members content for for uh, uh, something to be drafted in that line. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And yes, no problem with that. Uh, I suppose probably just, uh, and I hope members understood where I was coming from with my question regarding variations uh, and accountability with regards accessibility uh, to GP services. They're they're so different right across the board, and that's probably primarily down to their individual nature in relation to practices. But the Dr. Stout had mentioned a very interesting approach, uh, data-driven, to sort of really start to drill down into the individual performances of particular um, uh, practices across Northern Ireland regarding the conversion rate from face-to-face uh, or from phone consultation to face-to-face. I think members will find that there's quite a disparity across the board, even within practices. And I'd be very keen to know how how the department plan to uh, increase accountability in that system so that we can ensure that there is adequate access to services across Northern Ireland. In that. And uh, maybe that's a question that we can put directly to the department, but I think there is much more merit on us going down this line of, uh, of questioning. Yeah, yeah, I certainly think that's a, that's a valid uh, uh, question and, and our members content that we we write to the department on that issue. One of the issues that, that stood out for me was the lack of a, t- a clear timeline for the rollout of the multidisciplinary teams. I think it will be very useful to get some indication from the department now that now that we're uh, looking at trying to rebuild those services and the key, the central importance of the multidisciplinary teams and the fact that we're in, we heard that only one area um, we, we had been kind of operating on the basis that seven out of the 17 had some multidisciplinary work going on 
we hear today that that's six maybe out of 17, but also that only one area is complete. So I think if members were in agreement, I think we should write to the department asking for a timeline in terms of the planning on, on the rollout of the multidisciplinary teams to address some of the disparities that we've identified this morning. Are members content with that? Yep. Okay, well, listen, members, I'll take a short break there, just a 10 minute break, and we'll be coming back to Hyper 3 May. If we could come back at 11 15, please. Thank you. And could we suspend the broadcasting, please, Clerk? Thank you. Okay, members, um, welcome back, and we now resume our meeting. Um, we're going now to item six, which is a departmental briefing on the recommendations of the independent review on hyponatremia related deaths. So we're receiving a, a briefing, an update from the department today on progress on the implementation of the recommendations into the review on hyponatremia. I refer members to papers at tab six of your pack, which include a copy of the review's 96 recommendations and the official report from the previous briefing in March last year. The department's paper was emailed to members yesterday evening. I can advise members that a number of officials from the Department of Health are here to brief the committee today. So I would now like to welcome and ask broadcasting to bring into the spotlight Ms. Donna Ruddy, who is Acting IHRD Implementation Programme Director. Good morning, Donna. Uh, I can see you there. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Um, Thank Chair. you. Yes, go ahead. No, that's okay. That's okay. No, I just yeah, um, okay. I'm getting a bit of feedback. Sorry. Okay. 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 Um, okay. Uh, we are also joined by Mr. Quinton Oliver, who is chairperson of the Duty of Candor Workstream. Can you hear us okay, Quinton? Yes, indeed, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Karen Jeffrey, who is acting IHRD Implementation Program Manager. Karen, are you able to hear us okay? Yes. Good morning, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. And <clears throat> finally, Mr. David Best, who is the chairperson of the Death Certification Workstream. Are you able to hear us okay, David? We're not hearing you, David. If you can, uh, if you can see if there's something in your settings. Yeah, and I see David David has, has gone for headset. And if I could ask all members, I see most of the members of the panel do have headsets. We do find that a lot easier. But it's also important when people aren't speaking that they would uh, place themselves on mute as that can cause some feedback on the stream. So I'll just check your sound again. Uh, David, are you able to hear us now or can we hear you more importantly? We're still not hearing you, David. Um. There can be like there can be an on off an on off switch on your still not still not hearing you, David. What we'll do is we'll move on and we'll we'll hope that you will be able to to pick up. But for now, we're not able to hear you there on your on your end. Okay, so listen, I want to welcome all of you here this morning. This is clearly an issue of of very central importance in terms of of the future and in terms of accountability and, and looking back. But um, you're welcome to, we appreciate your attendance here this morning and we are looking forward to your presentation. So I will go ahead, uh, Donna, and just invite you to uh, brief us or to outline how you're going to address the briefing and then we'll go into a question and answer session. So go okay. ahead, please, Donna. Okay, Chair, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee on the implementation of the recommendations from the inquiry into hyponatremia related deaths. Um, First, can I just clarify that Quinton Oliver isn't a departmental official. He is he is the independent chair of the Judea Calendar Workstream, just for um, the record. Um, the IHRD report is a significant piece of work, as you've said, and it has implications for all parts of our health and social care system. It is also an important first in that the work that has been progressed by the implementation program, we have brought together frontline staff, regulators, various experts or partners in the community and the voluntary sector, uh, the coroner's office, but most importantly, we've brought our service users and carers with us. And we've brought all of these colleagues together to make sure that the changes that we do make are, they're truly robust and they're sustained. And this is co-production. This is what we would call our co-production approach. Um, you did refer to the last time that officials briefed the committee on the programme, and that was in early March of last year and at that um, presentation 
officials had set out the ethos of the program and the progress of the program at that point in time. And just to recap, in March of last year, uh, several work streams were approaching a point where the recommendations that their work addressed was near ready to be passed to the HSC for implementation. And in those cases, the next steps for those work streams were to finalize their papers um, to secure approval from the assurance work stream and then to develop the implementation circulars to be put out to the HSC. And prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the nine work streams and the seven subgroups, um, they were all meeting regularly to consider the implementation of the recommendations. Now, in mid-March of last year, the implementation program was paused. And this decision was taken to ensure that departmental staff and HSC staff were redirected to focus on the COVID critical work that was required. Um, and it was also a decision that was taken with the safety and well-being of our service users and carers as a priority. Now, while the suspension of the program, the implementation program, meant that much of the work was paused, we have been able to progress um, some key elements. And these include the statute duty of candor, uh, the being open guidance, the independent medical ser examiner service, the HSE board member handbook, and a statement of rights for those involved in serious adverse instances. Um, in his report, Mr. Justice O'Hara put candor first. Um, the report recommended uh, the introduction of a statute duty of candor for organizations and a separate duty of candor for staff, um, both with criminal sanctions attached for breach. And accompanying these two um, duty of candor recommendations, there were further recommendations regarding uh, guidance and support and protection that should be provided for staff. And this is to enable um, to create a more open culture within our HSA. Um, as I've said, we were able to progress some key elements of the program in recent months, uh, with Judy Kander being one of those. And um, you may be aware that Minister announced this morning um, a timetable for the public consultation on the policy proposals for statute duty of candor and being open framework and the public consultation opens on the 12th of april and it's going to run for a period of 16 weeks and a statute duty of candor would create um, a legal responsibility for all healthcare organizations and individual staff to be honest when things go wrong and the duty of candor work stream members they have proposed that a statute duty of candor for organizations with criminal sanctions attached for breach of the duty or obstruction of this duty should be enacted. Now, the work stream heard differing views about the statute duty of candor for individuals, um, particularly in relation to the criminal sanctions for breach. And the work stream, they were unable to find a preferred option that represented this wide range of views. So as a result, the, the work stream the work stream had proposed three options to implement the individual duty of candor and through the public consultation uh, the department will be seeking the views on each of those options um, the statute duty of candor policy proposals also includes a framework for openness uh, which seeks to create the conditions to further embed the culture of openness and honesty across our health and social care and support and training and guidance is central to this to get this culture of openness out there. So work is underway to develop guidance for individuals, staff and organizations. This is run in parallel to the statute duty of candor. Um, another key element of the program that we've been able to progress in recent months is work around the independent medical examiner service. Uh, the report recommends that an independent medical, or medical examiner service should be introduced in Northern Ireland. Now, this is another recommendation that will require public consultation and legislation. However, prototypes to determine the most appropriate way to create such a service and identify the implications for all those involved in operating this service, they're actively progressing. And the learning, and the learning coming out of these will be used to develop uh, proposals and options for an independent medical service in Northern Ireland. And this will issue for wider consultation in due course. Other work that we've been able to progress in recent months is the development of a statement of what you should expect 
if you're involved in a serious adverse incident. Now, poor communication during the SAI review process can add to the pain of those families and staff involved. And this statement has been developed in partnership by service users, CARES and HSC staff as members of the SAI workstream. And this statement uh, sets out the rights for those involved in an SAI. And it's going to support not just the families, but the staff who help the families throughout the SAI process. Um, it's the intention that it's going to be passed to all HSC organisations uh, for implementation in the coming months. Now, looking ahead at the programme, the implementation of the recommendations is reliant on the HSC being able to take them forward. Uh, the new policies, the procedures, the training and the working practices will be rolled out to the HSC to implement. Um, but we must be mindful of the extra pressures that this will bring to the system at this difficult time. Nonetheless, the implementation of the recommendation remains a priority, but a measured approach must be taken in order to ensure the commitment of everyone who's been involved to date in the changes that we are aiming to make. Um, Chair, I'm very happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Donna. Thank you for that. So, listen, first of all, I do want to address an issue around the briefing that was supplied to the committee. Now, this session has been flagged up for quite some time in terms of our forward work with the department. And it is, as you say, an issue of huge complexity in itself, but of huge central importance to the delivery of health and social care moving forward. And I suppose I do want to, before I, I get into the, the substance of that, acknowledge the pain and heart of every one of the families who are impacted by the, the issues that the O'Hara report has focused upon. So at three minutes past five last night, the committee received your briefing 18 hours ago in advance of a very substantive session. Now, that has, that there has been an ongoing issue with the department with papers arriving very late in the day in, in relation to these sessions. But in particular, in relation to this, I have to say that given the complexity of it, I think it's it's very regrettable. I have to say, very frankly to you, that I find it discourteous and unprofessional. And this is something that we must address with the department. But can you explain why that briefing was provided to committee members so late yesterday? Chair, I can only apologise for that. I, am, I wasn't aware the briefing only arrived last night. Um, it would not be my intention to to provide briefing at such short notice um, to a committee, especially on such a sensitive subject um, and important. And Chair, I, all I can do is I, I can apologise and I will endeavour for that not to happen in the future. Okay, okay, and I and, and I appreciate that, uh, Donna, and I, and I would appreciate if you would, if you would reflect that back more widely to the department. I mean, in terms of us providing the scrutiny or indeed the advice and support role, it's important that we we have a uh, appropriate time to consider, um, to consider the the information that's being presented, especially where this is a session that's been planned for some time in advance. But anyway, I'll I'll move on. So I want to now just go to the uh, the duty of candour and the, the, the central importance of that. And interestingly, I attended a, a meeting this week uh, with the pharmacy forum, and there was a phrase used as part of that meeting. It was in relation to uh, racism, but I think actually it applies very, very neatly here and indeed across the health and social care system. But the phrase was, and I, I can't ascribe to the original person who said it, but the phrase was, that culture will eat strategy for breakfast. And I think it, what, it, what it indicates is that the culture of an organization is crucial. And I think we have, uh, and I think other committee members will, will probably agree that we have too often seen a situation where members of staff are reluctant or hesitant to come forward to admit where things have went wrong, where the system has reacted when, when, when the realization dawned something has gone wrong, the system has reacted in a way that has been to delay or defer or prevent information from flowing. Um, and I, I think that that has led to a situation where we now see we're here in the north, we're actually dealing with, I think, approximately a quarter of all the public inquiries into health and social care issues across England, Scotland, Wales and here, a quarter of them are located here. So I think that is that is fed into that. So I wonder, could you elaborate for us the three options being uh, being put out to consultation and the kind of the, the rationale behind those and what 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 uh, 
what process has led you to concluding that these three options are the best way forward in order to deal with this culture and to, to support staff? And I think that's the key thing for me anyway, um, that, that staff do genuinely feel supported to come forward because we very much recognize that staff need to learn that there are no perfects here, that this is a complex area of work, and, and we want to ensure that staff feel protected within that. Yeah. So if Chair, we can get some further information on that, please. Yes. Chair, I'd like to direct that question on the options to uh, Quinton, who was the independent chair for the work stream, who, who developed the policy proposals. Thank you, Donna. Yeah, thank you. Quinton. Thank you, uh, Chair, for that uh, question, which goes to the heart of this uh, and is so important. And you're right to underline the point about culture. Uh, and that's why when the uh, Justice O'Hara report arrived in 2018, uh, I was impressed that the department didn't just issue guidance, implement this, because that wouldn't have changed the culture and behaviours of those key people in our health and social care services. What they did was embark on this massive co-production exercise. Uh, they invited me as an outsider. I, I don't work within the system. I'm a service user, obviously, and I'm a taxpayer. Therefore, I'm a funder and committed to the service. But I was independent, and they asked me to help uh, to create recommendations that would uh, uh, understand the dynamics of a service already under pressure before COVID, uh, and that's why I agreed to take it on. When it comes to the particular recommendations, O'Hara's flagship recommendation was uh, you need the legislative weight behind the uh, instruction and the guidance to staff to tell the truth and be honest and open on all affairs. And he found from his inquiry with the massive evidence that he heard that uh, uh, you needed that legislative weight with criminal sanctions. Now, there's then a mixed view that we picked up from uh, clinicians, uh, the regulators, the professional bodies, the trade unions, and uh, service users within the system and staff within the system. Some believe that that criminal sanction is too heavy and it adds to fear and bureaucracy and doesn't promote openness, although that's what O'Hara said. So option one is to go ahead with the criminal sanctions for the organization and for individuals who are found not to have been sufficiently open and honest. The second option is to make it an offense, but to withdraw the criminal sanctions so that it's not a criminal sanction and the individual, if found to have breached the duty of candor, should be dealt with by their employer and by their regulator and by their professional body. And the third option is to separate it out uh, and again, not to have a, a criminal sanction for breach of the duty of candor, uh, but to separately propose legislation that uh, will hold to account any individual in health and social care and the third sector bodies who sometimes uh, uh, deliver that uh, uh, to, uh, to have uh, uh, that as a separate offence uh, uh, for withholding or obstructing or changing or uh, altering uh, uh, information. And that's why we've put those into the consultation and having talked for two years now with all the players within the system, we now want to get a wider public view uh, of that to see where the uh, problems might arise because some say it could affect uh, morale and it could affect recruitment, but others say it will strengthen uh, that beacon of purpose of a health and social care system that is honest about its uh, mistakes where they're made and is moving forward uh, with service users, explaining them what's happening. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I think I think it is hugely important. And I think the emphasis should rightly be on supporting staff to be able to come forward. Because any organisation, particularly the larger an organisation is, the more it relies on people being willing and able to identify problems early and address those. So I think I think I would welcome that. 
the other question I would have, and, and uh, Donna, I'm quite happy for you to direct the questions to whichever member of your panel there are, are best, uh, and if we could have a sort of a substantive answer from one person, and only if there's additional information, just to, just to smooth the time the timing issues. So I'm quite happy for you to do that, Donna. My second question before I go to members then is around the implementation uh, plan and, and the lack of a detailed implementation plan. I accept that COVID has certainly uh, interfered and, and in, intruded on the process. However, we are going back um, some time now and we're still not looking at a detailed implementation plan for the 96 recommendations. So can you just outline uh, when we can expect to see a detailed implementation plan around some of these? And also there are two areas that, that are 94 of the areas have been substant substantively moved on in your briefing paper. You re refer to two that, that are less so. Could you, could you tell us which those are and why those are, those are sort of trailing behind in that sense? We're not hearing you there, Donna. Just a few Hello? Seconds. Hello? Yep, I'm getting you. Yeah, yep, no, that, you that, that's okay. I actually have myself on mute. Um, yes, you're right that uh, the at this time last year, there was none of the recommendations that were fully implemented, um, and that is still the case. But as I said in my opening statement, we were very close to um, to developing the circulars and such like to get out to the HSC. Um, I honestly cannot say today when this um, program will have all the recommendations implemented. But what I can say is for, you're right, there, there are 94 out of the 96 recommendations that have, um, for each recommendation, we have an assurance framework developed. And that assurance framework would set out the actions that are required to implement the recommendation. And 94 of the 96 recommendations um, those assurance frameworks have gone through the assurance work stream. We reconvened the assurance work stream um, in October of last year. And as I said, we now have action plans for 94 of the 96. What I can't do is put today a, a timetable against each of those because we are so reliant on our work stream members um, and the, the, the HSA to bring to push these forward. Um, but we have, as I said, tried to progress what we can with the with available resources, both in the department, but more importantly, out in the HSE. Um, you're right, there are two recommendations, um, which are the Child Death Overview Panel and recommendation um, 94 on the redress scheme. Now, the Child Death Overview Panel, um, there has been movement in recent I have to say recent weeks actually on that in that um, the SBNI is undertaking a piece of work to establish a process for a child death review in Northern Ireland and a working group has been recently established and their terms of reference have been agreed and it is estimated that the work of this group is going to take about 12 months and that's going to include a submission of their final report and a draft of their final report will be submitted to the chair of the SBNI by the end of this year. Um, and it will include the, the full options appraisal of how the SBNI would fulfill its statutory duties um, as they relate to the review of child deaths in Northern Ireland. Um, and in this report, they've also been asked to specify the timescales for the implementation. So there has been, in that that's very recent, uh, movement on that. Uh, in terms of the redress, redress scheme, um, prior to the COVID uh, pandemic, discussions were ongoing on how best to take um, these forward. Uh, however, that actually has not been progressed, but it is on our, our plan to try and pick that up again and get that recommendation moved. So yes, it's, it's not what what I want to be sitting here today saying in, in that we, we, we don't have a definite date, um, but we are so reliant on uh, the wider HSA to, to be able to move these forward. But what I can say to the committee is that we have, as I said, the action plans against 94 of the recommendations. So we know what needs to be done. It's just to try and map out how we can do this. And, and we want to do it um, through the ethos of the co-production, which has been key to the program from its from its beginning, um, so we 
we need to bring everybody along. Um, but my, it is my intention that we will map out those that we can because there are recommendations, there is action plans that, that I can say sh could be implemented in, in the next six months. Um, but again, I, I would be reluctant to say definitely this, that, and you know, to list them out in fear that something may hit the system again. I don't know. Um, but I, I can share with the committee the actions that we know what we have to do and where best I could put, you know, we can we can map out the plan. Um, but again, it, it is um, it could be subject to change is, is what my concern is. Yeah, no, and, and I do. I have to say, I do share share your disappointment, given how how important that all is. Just just want to clarify, just that that's the safeguarding board you're referring to there. Just for those who may be listening yes, in, sorry, the safeguarding sorry, board is yeah. No, that's that's okay. Um, that's okay. Yeah, if yeah, and I think I think if you could provide the committee with a detailed uh, action plan to, to give us some more detail about that, that, that would be useful uh, subsequent to this meeting. Yes. Yeah. So let's well, thank 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 you for that, Donna. I'm going to move on to members' questions then. So I'm going to first of all to Carol Neekillen. Go ahead, Carol, please. Morning at the committee, and I know the chair has covered our disappointment. Um, in fact, this May, I get in a report so late yesterday evening. Um, but my uh, concerns um, are really around the content of the report. I find it the most unambitious, disappointing, defensive response to an inquiry that dealt with uh, on the untimely death of children that I've ever seen. And I know this is the first of its kind, but I, I think it's a, frankly, it's a disgrace. Um, the fact, in your own words, Donna, you said implementation of recommendations depend on the HSE taking them forward. I, I think that's completely unacceptable. This, for me, should be a position where the department is setting down the recommendations from the O'Hara report, rather than asking the, the Health and Social Care Trusts if they're minded to, they couldn't, you know, you know, implement these recommendations. I think it's completely ridiculous and I think it's an insult. The other question I have is in relation to, so we have one consultation on the duty of candor. You've mentioned another. How many consultations are there going to be in relation? Because what I'm saying here is all process and very little outcome. And then the other question I have is, there are two questions. Were the families of those children who died part of the co-production and co-design? And in terms of Justice O'Hara's criticisms, um, particularly uh, in relation to some of the uh, officials or some of the, the health and social care staff involved, were they going to be reflected in this report? And I don't see an implementation plan at all. I see this as a defensive pro process-driven uh, piece of work rather than getting to the heart of a very significant public inquiry, which there are still very significant uh, concerns are. So I just have to say, I want to put it in record, I think this this uh, piece of work here is completely scandalous. Okay. Um, there's a number of questions, Member, you've raised. Firstly, again, can I just apologise for the timing of the briefing that was received? And as I said at the beginning to Chair, when I was made aware, um, I that is not what I would have wished for. I would have wished the committee had have had uh, sufficient time uh, to consider it. And going forward, um, if we're back again, I will endeavour to ensure the committee has sufficient time to consider briefing. Um, member, you mentioned... Um, about the process that it seems to be a lot of processes and that there are a number of consultations that have been mentioned. Um, from the outset, the whole program, the implementation program is being done through co-production and that is where we it is done to ensure that everybody is brought along, that we hear the views. The service users have been, it is taking longer. It's taking longer than, than previous um, a previous piece of work that would have been taken forward where the department would have just said, right, this is what happens. But this process of co-production has brought along all the voices, very differing views, um, and have challenged the, the maybe the thinking of the department. Judy Cantor one is, is an example of where 
even with all the, with all the views around the table, it was clear that uh, there wasn't full agreement for very for very valid reasons, um, and it's been put out for consultation. And by investing this time and through the co-production process, the outcome will be better because we've heard the views, we've brought people along, and we're we are hoping that everybody um, has heard why 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 we're at where we're at in terms of how the recommendations will be implemented. Um, you also asked about um, the families and how they've been engaged with and uh, the families that are named in the report um, have been engaged with according to their preference. Um, from the beginning, they, they, they made very clear how they would like to be engaged with throughout the implementation program and we have um, adhered to that and we have kept them updated. So we have, um, and your fourth point was around um, persons named in the report. Um, now, in terms of the implementation program that, that we're here to discuss today and the process, the, the implementation program, um, it was developed to take forward the recommendations coming out of the report any issues relating to workforce or personnel that were named in the report, they're being taken forward outside of the programme. And this distinction and separation, it is crucial to maintain, you know, the integrity of the implementation programme. They're completely separate process. Colin, we just lost Donna a bit there, sorry. Um at, at the end, yeah. your your sound has been has been in and out a wee bit there, Donna. Um, How's it? You finished there, I think. On, on yeah. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you there now. So, Carol, is was a part of that you want to reiterate there, or go back on given the sound issue? Well, I, I just feel that whatever that separate process is, the fact that you know this. Even the consultation on Judy Candor has been delayed, which is quite shocking. But the process and the separation of individuals uh, criticised by Justice O'Hara, um, we, we, we would need to know what that process is um, because it's not, um, it's, it's not definitive enough, in my opinion. Uh, as I said, the implementation programme is is very separate from any other outside processes um, that are dealing with uh, workforce or personnel issues. And what I had said was that that um, distinction and separation, you know, it is crucial to maintain the integrity of the implementation program. So this, this, this the work uh, what, that we're what here. I, what, what I said processes, processes are you referring to, Don? Well, if the if you're talking about uh, persons who were named in the report, you know, there is if there's a regulatory process, and then you know, if it's the GMC, for example, you know, they are separate processes. The process, the process that I and we're involved in is implementation of the recommendations, and any criticisms or any issues that have been raised around workforce or personnel um, are not part of the implementation program. But they're part of public confidence, Donna, and and that's the issue. So I would still chair with respect asked exactly what uh, what processes outside of the implementation of the recommendations ha have been enacted or are, are underway or under investigation. We've already established that the chief scientific advisors uh, court case has not been paid by public funds. We've had to establish that through asking questions. I think it would be much better for public confidence if we knew what was happening to those criticised in the report and what those processes are. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Donna? Uh, I can't address those. Those are outside of my remit because say, I'm very, my work is very separate. It is around the implementation of the programme, but I can take the question back to colleagues in the department. Um, for a response on that, okay. and as as I've said, you know, we have um to maintain the as I keep saying to maintain the integrity of the program. 
uh, I am focused on implementation of the recommendation within the report. Um, but I say we okay, can take well, the question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and, and separately then we will want an update from the department in relation to what other processes are being undertaken to address the uh, the the accountability within the within the public inquiry. Okay, so I'm going then to Jonathan Buckley for a question. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And I suppose probably to begin with, I would share similar concerns that you have raised, and indeed, Carol McCullen. I, I do think it's absolutely scandalous that we have only received this statement embargoed till 9 a.m. this morning, but we received it at after 5 o'clock yesterday on an issue which was put on record for many weeks and months that we wanted a briefing from the department. The more sceptical members among us would say that this is nothing more than a distraction from the evidence that we were due to hear today. In relation to its content, I would share similar concerns as to Carol in relation to uh, its scant and detail and extre express extreme disappointment as to the length of time it has taken to get where we are. And I do put on record that the Minister has been in post for one year and has had to be dealing with COVID, as has a large section of the uh, the health system. Uh, but this was a, the, the Minister mentioned that this is one of his major priorities. Before the Minister, uh, during that period of, of, of collapse in, in terms of government, I would imagine I would be hope to be reassured that this was still a major priority for the Department of Health and that significant work would have been carried out. Because here we have some three years on for families to read headlines this morning that it could take another three to four years for some of these implementations to come through. I think that is wrong. I feel we have added stress and anxiety to the families involved. They were failed by the health network and have literally had to fight at every opportunity for the truth in relation to the deaths of their loved ones. They're exhausted and extremely skeptical. So can I ask why the Department of Health have opted for a 16 week consultation in relation to Judy of Candor? That's my first question. Um, there is a 16 week consultation as we felt it was necessary to run a longer consultation than normal um, to ensure engagement across a wide set, the wide groups that we want to engage with. And also because of the current rest rest restrictions in meeting up, we, we'll be holding smaller virtual consultation events. So through the, the consultation plan, it is going to take longer. Um, and groups have welcomed this, this that there is a 16 week uh, engagement um, period for engagement um, because we want to hear, we want to hear from people. I, I think it would have been, um, I don't think it would have been proper of us to run a, a six week consultation event um, when we're, when we're now, this, this is running events in a very different world and um, we can't bring hundred people into a venue to discuss with them and to manage a hundred people virtually at one time it, it, it is more difficult we've had numerous um, uh, engagement events up to the development of the proposals um, in in the in what I call the real world and in more recent times in the virtual world and in smaller focus groups it has worked so it has so um, an answer to that the the 16 week uh, consultation period has been welcomed um, to allow us to get out and engage in in the new way that we, we will be doing it. Okay, well, I, I would imagine you would realise that there, there is significant challenges with the 16 week given the parliamentary timetable and how this will inevitably lead to uh, potential legislation coming before the House in a new mandate, adding for further delay. And given the statement that you've made as to the already lengthy period of engagement that there has been across the sector over this past year or more, I do find that quite disturbing, uh, given the fact that we are working within a, a time frame here. In relation to the statement that was put to us, Chair, it, it states at no stage has the department sought to challenge the validity of uh, Doctor of Mr. Justice O'Hara's criticism? Relevant employers have taken them similarly without challenge 
as a starting point for the consideration of the need or otherwise for further action against any individuals named in the report. Would uh, the panel accept that this stands in stark contrast to actually the reality? Because the Belfast Trust considered included our considerations included a detailed review on the 5th of March 2019 of the inquiry report where it stated that in relation to its review that our considerations have now concluded that I am satisfied that no further action is required and that was in relation to a particular individual Professor Young that was named within the report but that stands in contrast with the regulator who wants to investigate this particular issue. So could I ask, how can we as politicians, and indeed in this particular instance, uh, Claire Roberts' family, have any confidence in the system going forward? Member, as I said, I, I am not involved in any other process other than on the implementation of the recommendations. Um, I have no insight into the other processes that are dealing with either workforce or personnel that have been named in the report. And the reason for that is, it is, as I've said before, it is that distinction and separation between uh, personnel and workforce that issues or whatever has been named in the report, it's been kept separate from the implementation of the recommendations. So, so I, I, unfortunately, I cannot, um, answer that question. It, it, it's a similar question that was asked by a previous member. Um, and as I offered at that stage, that is something that you know can be, be raised with the department to provide well, um, a response yeah. to. Donna, I, and I accept that. And you've come before the committee today to brief us on the hyponatremia report. And we, we, have, we have to take into account, though, that the minister released a statement uh, in to nine o'clock this morning in relation to the report. And here I just on, on glance have picked up a significant contradiction in my opinion. Therefore, there is an extreme issue in relation to public confidence in this particular case. So I would ask you to take away to the department my personal dissatisfaction, as I'm sure has been mentioned by a previous member, their dissatisfaction in terms of some of the ambiguities involved here. We need clarity. The families need clarity. And we need to get on with implementing uh, Justice O'Hara's report in full. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll go on then to Jerry Carroll. Go ahead, Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, panel. Um, yeah, I think there is a, a palpable sense of anger amongst families. I mean, the fact this report was uh, published three years ago, and as I understand it, maybe six of the recommendations, not a single one has been implemented. And I share a member's comments about the report uh, issued last night. And also, we had a statement from the Minister uh, issued 15 minutes before this committee started. It's really shambolic and contemptible, and I want to add my uh, concern to that as well. Um, I want to ask two quick questions and then a follow-up question. Um, first is on uh, how many staff were previously working on um, process and the implementation and the working groups uh, pre-COVID, and how many of those staff um, were forced to um, deal with the pandemic? Um, an answer on that would be helpful, um, because there is a feeling you know, COVID is obviously very challenging, but I think there's a feeling amongst families that this is being uh, purposefully uh, slowed down and delayed. Um, second question for this part uh, is on the duty of candor legislation. Uh, and, and with respect, what I'm hearing is basically there's an idea uh, or a suggestion that uh, there probably won't be legislation implemented that will uh, allow for doctors or medical professionals to be prosecuted. Not in the case of mistakes or not in the case of uh, human error, but in the case of, of lying uh, and lying in the cases of, of um, um, mistreatment and neglect of, of, uh, of healthcare people. So that's 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 what I'm sort of seeing and, 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 and sort of flags up uh, to me from the presentation so far. And just for this part, um, I mean, it's been suggested to me that there's been a level of disengagement from the families themselves because they're concerned that the department uh, isn't moving swiftly enough in terms of implementing the recommendations. Uh, they have effectively withdrawn because they have, they have no or little faith. Uh, so would, would that be an accurate reflection? Maybe for Donna to answer that one, and then I'll come back with a, another question. Thanks. Okay. So... Um Jerry, first question is how many staff were involved in the implementation? There are there was around two hundred members across all the work streams. 
So there was, um, which ranged from yeah, staff within the department, staff within the HSE, uh, voluntary sector, regulators, other ALBs. Um, and I, I don't have to hand actual numbers of key staff that where they've been diverted to. Um, but what I can say is that um, the work that we were progressing, and we did try to pick up other pieces of work in September with key pers you know, members of work streams, but they were unable to, um, they had no capacity. They, they're frontline staff. And, and, and so, you know, it was, it's, um, we, we, you couldn't force them. And as I said along, we want to bring everybody along. Everybody's been involved, you know, want to continue the process of co-production. Um, you had three questions. Your third question, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to your second question on Judy Calendar because I'll, I'll ask Quentin to, to take that one around the, the three options. Um, your third question uh, was in relation to the families. Um, I said the families from the outset uh, give their preference on how they wished to be engaged with on the implementation program. And um, we have continued to do, to do that through their wishes. Um, and, and Jerry, that's all I could say around the families that um, we have engaged as they have asked us to. Have they disengaged? Well, no, because we have, you know, there has been engagement with them. Um, I wouldn't say that they've disengaged. And uh, what I can say is that not all not all families at the outset wanted to be part of the, the implementation program, and and we would obviously respect and and we have respected how the families wish to be engaged with throughout. So we have um and. Quentin, can I ask you to take the second question, which was around the legislation on the duty of candor, um, and it was the options? Of course. Let, let me reassure the committee there's, there's no attempt to uh, change or reject or dilute the flagship recommendations of the O'Hara report. But what a good consultation does is it sets up areas where there is uh, disagreement it outlines potential options and then it invites insights because what we're hearing from voices within the system, uh, from professional bodies and regulators, is that this will add a burden and a fear and will uh, provoke defensive medicine uh, in terms of people being careful and not making decisions properly. As against the popular view, uh, which is that uh, all those acting on our behalf and we give the medical profession huge uh, authority over our bodies when we hand ourselves over must be brought to account for their uh, openness and honesty. And let me emphasize this is not about mistakes. Mistakes may always be made. But what people want is they want to know what happened uh, say sorry and reassure me this won't happen to anyone else. So that's what we want to do in the consultation. We're not going into it with uh, an empty mind. We're going with an open mind to explore how best to implement this without unintended consequences. Thanks. I mean, there was a lot in that, but uh, in the process or in the interest of time, I have to just uh, uh, come on the final question. Thanks, Chair. Um, in, in terms of the GMC uh, beginning the process of taking action uh, potentially against the Chief uh, Scientific Officer, um, are they still proceeding with that path, uh, even, even though the legal case was obviously unsuccessful from the Chief Scientific Officer's point of view? And also, there's, there seems to be an approach in the department, uh, some elements of the department uh, around trying to silence uh, journalists when they raise questions around um, what's been happened. I mean, I'll quote uh, a BBC journalist, Michael Buchanan, who said, I've just deleted my previous tweet about Professor Ian Young at the request of the NI Department of Health, who says he disputes the findings of the official O'Hara inquiry that criticised him. So is the Department of Health engaged in contacting journalists and asking them to remove uh, tweets or to cease from commenting on aspects uh, of the uh, inquiry? Thanks. Jerry, um, I said my. You have two questions. I've, I've taken two questions out of that in relation to the GMC, and the GMC um, is independent from the department, rightly so. And I mean, we wouldn't comment on any individual case. Um, in relation to uh, 
the department contacting the BBC around the, the program. Um, again, I can't comment on that. I, I'm the taking forward the implementation of the recommendations. Um, I have no knowledge of that. Uh, you know, the, the, it's in it's in the public sphere, and there's been other suggestions that it's that's happening with other journalists as well. I think uh, yeah. it's it's quite quite concerning. Okay, well, from from my perspective and from the implementation program perspective, um, I I have no knowledge of of that happening. You know, that's that's all I that's all I can say to that question. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And um, we we will we will be uh, I think in due course meeting with the minister again. And, and I suppose some of these questions can also be addressed there. But uh, you have you have uh, committed to addressing or bringing some of those back, uh, Donna. But I think those remain outstanding questions. Are clearly not getting addressed here today. So I think those remain outstanding. Okay. I need to move on then to um, Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, good morning, panel, and thank you for coming along this morning. Um, I, I was also concerned about the 16 weeks, but that's been raised for the consultation process. Also concerned about the child death overview panel and the delays in that. I think people need to reflect that this is not a, a recommendation just from the hyponatremia inquiry report, but it goes back to legislation from 10 years ago. So the very passive language that she used around trying to set it up is, I mean, my heart sank when I heard that this morning, but I don't mean to shoot the messenger, Donna, because I know this is a, a huge piece of work you're undertaking. Um, I, I was very disappointed as well to read the wording around the progress on the independent medical um, examiner service. I received, along with health spokespersons, probably about two and a half years ago from senior members of the Department of Health around the model that was going to be taken forward for this service. But again, the language in the briefing almost seems as if the, the work has stood still. We've had a pandemic for a year and I can excuse people for not working as heavily or, or as expediently during that time, but we're going back two, two and a half years. There doesn't seem to be any progress having been made. So can you please comment on what has happened with the model that was in place or being proposed two and a half years ago? I've got another question after that. Okay. Um, can I just pass that question about the independent medical examiner service to David? David, do you have signed? David, we're not. We're still not hearing you there. Um, whatever's going on from your end. Yeah, we're hearing even on the phone here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank we're you. Hearing you on the phone. There's a slight echo. There's a slight echo, but we are hearing you okay, so if you just take it slow. Okay, the echo is probably um, due to the fact that I'm watching you on the screen as well, Chair. So, <laughs> um, okay, I can assure Paula that the uh, independent medical examiner is actually up and running in a prototype basis, on a trial basis. And we have developed a number of prototypes um, but we're actually operating in two trusts at the moment, the Northern Trust and the Western Trust. <clears throat> and this has been in operation since last November. Um, so effectively what is happening is deaths that occur in the hospitals within those two trusts, i.e. Antimuria, Causeway, Altnagelvin and Southwest Acute. When there's a death there, um, that is reviewed by an independent medical examiner who's currently working within the, in the department here and they're assessing the uh, medical certificate of cause of death for three prime functions. Function number one, does the death need to be reported to the coroner service? Number two, is the state of cause of death uh, a reasonable conclusion given the uh, information and clinical information available to the doctor? And thirdly, are there any safety or clinical governance issues that need to be addressed? So that system has been up and, uh, and running. Um, that is giving us plenty of information in terms of what the implications of that might be. And one of those is actually 
making contact with the doctor, having a conversation with the doctor, and the independent medical examiner service will discuss the death with the doctor, talk it through, uh, and approve what has been written on the medical certificate of cause of death. So that system, as I say, has been operating uh, since November. It operated right through January and February uh, at the height of the pandemic, um, when um, there were obviously an increased number of deaths. Um, and that information will all be used to inform firm proposals for how such a system might operate. Okay, thank you. That, 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 that's progress, at least. I appreciate the update. I think the, the, the second question is in relation to um, the recommendation uh, or proposal that foundation doctors should not be employed in children's ward, wards. Um, I know that there's some of the profession opinion think that might not be workable, and I'm just wondering how that's being resolved in terms of how um, the, the department's responding to that recommendation. Donna, do you want to pick that one up? Hello? Yes, can I hear you? Thank yes, you. Yes, okay. um, yes, that's recommendation 13. And if recommendation 13 was implemented as written, uh, you're right that um, it would end up that there, there would be no um, new paediatricians because junior doctors wouldn't be able to train on paediatric wards. So for that recommendation, um, which is part, goes through part of the assurance framework process, is uh, the work stream would look at the recommendations and look at the definitions that they're applying to the recommendations. And so that actual recommendation, um, the intent behind it is there, but it is not, you know, the, the action plan for the implementation of it is not that it is as written, because as I've said, that would prevent um, paediatricians being, you know, new paediatricians coming into the system. So the work stream have um, considered that and, uh, as I say, have, have gone with the intent behind the recommendation, um, but to make sure that it doesn't um, have, you know, this perverse incentive, you know, that we wouldn't have any, uh, you are, we wouldn't have any junior doctors training in paediatric wards. Okay, thank you, Donna, and thank you for your work. Okay, thank you. And going there to Orlea Flynn, go ahead, Orlea, please. Um, thank you, and thanks to, to Donna and the panel. Um, so Donna, um, in the 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 briefing paper and the statement that was released this morning, um, I know that you were speaking earlier that um, so obviously the implementation of the recommendations remain a priority, um. But when the department's talking about taking this measured approach um, and the wording was actually to take a measured approach um, to ensure the commitment of everyone involved in the changes. Um, it, you were describing earlier that obviously your own responsibility is, is to focus on the implementation process and that that's, that's separate almost to the, you know, the workforce issues and, and the engagement and, and all the issues coming out of that. So when when the department's talking about taking this measured approach to ensure that there is that commitment of everyone involved, you know, is that in any way um, holding back or stalling, in your opinion, a more sort of um, swift delivery of getting the, the recommendations implemented? So I know that they're two sort of separate processes, but are you or the team finding it difficult to implement the recommendations more swiftly because of maybe, you know, additional concerns and, and you know, that, that, that um, the people are worried about? Um, Orlea, no, it's what what is meant by um, a more measured approach to ensure everybody's committed is, is it's around the ethos of the co-production. I say we have had uh, 200 members at the table, you know, split across the work streams and the subgroups and They've brought it so far, and but there's still a, a, another piece, you know, further work that needs done, and is to ensure that um, we we don't lose that, we don't lose that buy-in, we don't lose that that co-production ethos that everybody has been working uh, together to come to it, and uh, it is, I say, it is our intention 
to, to bring the groups back. We have been able to bring some back. We have been able to progress some of the work, but there are um, some pieces of work that we haven't been able to progress because the key members um, are tied up elsewhere. Um, and it is a priority for the department, I say, to, to get these, um, to move this forward, but to move it forward in the way that it has the ethos behind the programme is you know to do it together and i did say co-production it does take lot it does take longer um a longer length of time to do but it is worth it because we've had those voices at the table and we don't want to lose those voices at, at these critical stages um so it, it is disappointing it is extremely as i said i didn't you know i wouldn't didn't want to be sitting here a year later and maybe not having moved forward as much as we obviously would have intended to. But for this past 12 months, um, we've been very restricted in what we were able to progress, but we have progressed. Um, you know, we have got uh, our statute duty account or policy proposals. Um, the work stream has developed those to go out to consultation. Uh, Davy discussed the IMA and the work that was picked up there at, in, in the autumn of last year. Um, so we are, and, and I, I want to say this genuinely, we are genuine in getting this move forward, but we don't want to lose those those members that have been with us from, from the start um, who have, I say, challenged us and, and put different debates and different conversations around the tables. Um, so. Okay, thank you, Donna. And then I suppose maybe just to follow on from that, um, I know Carl had asked about it um, earlier on in, in, in her question. And so when we were, you were talking about then the, the, the action plans that you have um, sort of finalised, but then the issue is going to be the reliance on the health and social care staff to try and, you know, push those action plans forward. Um, and I'm just wondering, you were talking about, so the department needs to map out how you can best do this. Can you elaborate on that, you know, in, in any more detail for the committee? And I know that you says that you didn't want to, you don't want to start mentioning. So, like, some of the recommendations um, at the moment could be implemented within the next six months. But I understand that you don't want to start naming which recommendations if that can't be done. But, um, you know, even when, when we're talking about maybe some of the recommendations that could be over the line over the next six months, without even being specific to which ones those are, could you maybe give us an indication of maybe, you know, how many you're talking about out of the 94? And when you talk about then mapping out um, how the health and social care staff can try and push this forward, is there any more, has the department worked out then a plan on how you're going to map that out, basically? There, there is, um, I have to say, there's also, there's... Um, throughout the programme there's been engagement with the trusts and within the trusts they have an oversight committee on IHRD so whenever we have um I'll actually bring it back we've got our 90 94 recommendations with agreed action plans right some of those action plans uh, would require um implementation circulars to be drafted and that could be done by possibly departmental staff in conjunction with uh, colleagues out in, in the sector um so we have a say, you're right, this plan. I, I am reluctant to give even numbers earlier on, on, the, on, on how many recommendations. Um, but what I have given a commitment to is I will share with the committee um, uh, the document that has these action plans mapped against each recommendation. And these action plans have been agreed by the work streams and approved by the assurance work stream. Um, but there is then this further discussion of with our trust colleagues on which we can implement. We need to agree timescales for implementation. Um, and that's that's the bit that has still to be done um, before we could start committing to timescales. And again, and I just again want to, to say that it's all dependent on on where we are on, on, on where we are. And I mean, we as the department, the HSC, our colleagues, um, our service users and carers who've been involved in the process. Um, but I do want to say, like, I, I am committed to getting to getting this pushed forward. OK, and just thank me just quickly, Donna, thank you for that. And so see that um, that that engagement with the trust colleagues and, and that, um, you know, that that forum that, that's been set up where, where you're engaging with the trusts. So um, obviously then that's where you are going to agree the time scales and next steps of the 94 recommendations. D does that body of people meet 
um, every so often um, and when is the next engagement with them. Thank um, you. Prior, prior to, before the programme was paused, there were regular meetings. Um, I say this, the programme, um, we've been able to put some uh, resource into it in September, from September of last year, effectively. Uh, we haven't had a collective um, meeting up across all the trusts. There has been engagement with, with individual trusts on it, but we're, what we need, what we will be doing is mapping out which recommendations and taking those to the, the collective group, uh, you know, the trust oversight group, um, on how they would then, uh, we would agree our, our delivery or implementation plans for that. And time there's scales. no indication yet, Donna, then, of that, that next meeting of the trust oversight group, no? No, there, there, there's not, but there has been engagement with the trusts um, in, individually. Thank you, Donna. So has. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, and uh, finally then, in terms of members indicating at this point, I'm going to Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your, your time here today. Um, I also don't want to shoot the messenger, but I think it has to be said that this is a very, very difficult area, not least for those that have been bereaved. And this incredibly long, drawn-out process to implement recommendations doesn't help um, those grieving families. So I just wanted to put that on record. Um, I wanted to ask just one quick question because most of the questions have been asked and answered already. Have you any early feedback on the um, on the duty of candor recommendation uh, as a department already? Um, can you share that with us if you have? Um, sorry, Pam. Early feedback from from uh, on the duty of candor recommendation. So, if you anything, any early feedback on on that, or is Kate you just haven't consulted with it? Um, there, I've maybe passed this to Quentin to discuss uh, the engagement that's been held. You know, in the the two years to develop the the proposals. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, we, uh, obviously we have concentrated on the duty of candour and it's the criminal sanction for individuals that has attracted most attention. And as I said earlier, there are some who feel that this would have negative unintended consequences and others who believe that it's essential to restore trust and to bring individuals to account where they are found not to have been open and honest with patients, uh, service users and carers. In order to test this more widely, we did commission an opinion survey uh, in the last couple of months, which did produce some really interesting results. Uh, and it said that uh, roughly, these are very roughly, that uh, uh, people are very happy with the health and social care service they get when it works. But when something goes wrong, they are less than happy. And that's when people record a, a obfuscation, uh, poor communication, lack of communication, stonewalling, uh, and failure to be open and honest. And that gives us a reassurance and it gives us strong evidence because that poll was 2,300 people. So it's not just a handful that is statistically valid. Uh, it gives us confidence that there is real concern out there when things go wrong. And that's why the culture change, which the chair started uh, an hour ago, quite rightly, that culture eats strategy. So you can put in all the legislation, but unless you change the culture and the behaviours, and that's where it often comes down to teams, because teams and groups are intensely loyal in order to get things done. But when they see one of their members, one of the team uh, misbehaving, uh, it is very easy to group around them and protect them rather than to separate yourself and say something has happened. And that's where we do need the massive culture change and the attitude and behavior change of practitioners right across the system. And that's why the co-production process gives us confidence that we're more likely to get ownership of the implementation and of the changes and legislation if you as the legislators decide that uh, criminal sanctions should be applied. There's more likely to be ownership if these have been fully uh, talked out. 
And that's why I'm fully supportive of the 16 weeks, because I think it is really important to explain and to understand and to hear the insights of people on the ground, whether they're on one side of the fence delivering health and social care or on the other side as patients, carers and service users. That's great. Um, thank you for that. I wonder, is it would it be possible to share that survey with the committee? Yes, of um, course. Um, um, can, I, can I also just add to that, that um, all the evidence and feedback that the Workstream have uh, created over the time in developing this is available on the department's website. Um, I can share that. That would be great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So that's that's all. That's all the indications I have at this at this point in time. There's a few issues I want to pick up on, and I suppose just just to touch on that last issue that you addressed there, Quentin, in relation to the need to change the culture around where people feel empowered to be able to say, um, "I saw a member of my team do something which I believe is wrong or whatever." But I think also we need to even go a step beyond that, where an individual themselves feels safe enough to say. I did something wrong and I because carrying the burden of that or or that being compounded I think I think is also a problem that, that needs to be addressed and I think again culture the organizational culture could go some way to allowing people to identify where, where things can improve so I think that's useful there's a number of things I want to just touch upon before I wrap up um, and I am I am conscious a dollar that we have it several times said that, that we we don't want to shoot the messenger in a sense and nor do i however i am conscious that you are the acting director of the this implementation program and therefore in many senses we're, we're speaking to the right person and there is i think a, an overall theme of a lack of detail and a lack of information a couple of points that you have committed to uh, providing further information and I, I welcome that commitment in relation to the question that jerry asked around the numbers originally involved and how many of those have now been replaced or stood back up again. I would like to see some actual detail maybe on in relation to that, that those numbers are provided to the committee. Um, I have a bit of a concern around the consultation process, not from the point of view of um, absolutely want to see a good consultation and good co-production and co-design. However, it's, it's crucial that that is not seen as part of the process, but is inherent within every step of the process from start to finish and is being done on a routine basis. So I think it would be it would be regrettable if we we're looking at a situation where we're saying, well, things are going to be delayed because we now have this new thing of consultation. I think that needs to be just worked through everything. I, I, and I see you shaking your head. So I understand you're not you're not saying that. I'm just saying that I have found, and I think a lot of across a lot of areas, we have found that actually as a result of COVID, in some ways, consultation is not more difficult, but actually more some of the platforms that have been developed allow broader and wider consultation. It brings its own problems, but there are there are justifiable improvements. For example, in all party groups, I have seen where attendance at all party groups at times have gone from maybe half a dozen to a dozen people have now. I've, I've been at all party groups with 85 people, people from the furthest reaches of Fermanagh and Derry who may have struggled to get to meetings previously, people with disabilities or people who are housebound who can now engage. So I think the department needs to very, very quickly, as the rest of society have done, move to to uh, the, that, that new reality and embracing it and actually mining the benefits of it. The other thing I do uh, want to touch upon there, and again, this is, this is I suppose, uh, in a sense, you are the messenger in this sense, but communications with this committee, with the department in terms of the technology, continue to be poor. And I have to say, it's, it's specific to the Department of Health. We have, we have met with the Department for Education, Public Health Agency, Health and Social Care Board, a range of sectors, and they often are able to meet the, technolog the technological challenges much more effectively than than evidence we're taking from the department. So I would ask that the department looks at its communications. It clearly is a very, a very strong communications department or arm within the department, but I think the technology end of things needs to be improved. So if you could also bring that back for us, and I accept that's not that's not something under your direct control. And finally, then, just in terms of the public confidence and the family engagement, um, we didn't really get any detail there today on what 
uh, family engagement there has been and how the families continue to be kept involved in this process throughout. So if you could maybe provide us with some further information on that. And also there is the outstanding, inform the outstanding areas around personnel. And finally, then you have agreed that those action plans will be forwarded, and I thank you for that. So, listen, that's 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 been uh, that's that's been very useful in that sense. I do want to thank you for coming to the committee this morning and for addressing the questions in, in as far as they were addressed, and to wish you all the very best in uh, in the time ahead in this very very important and seminal work. This this is the key junction here, where you know not only have we identified those very significant harms that were done, but there are potential now to do better. And as Quentin said at the, at the outset, families want to see, for, first of all, what happened. Second of all, what's going to be done to address it. And third of all, that it won't happen to anyone else. And I think that is common across a range of, of issues from Muckamore to Dunmore, neurology. That's a common theme. And I think, I think we need to grasp the opportunity to involve those who have experienced it and who can contribute to the solutions. So uh, thank you for that, Donna, and thank you to your to your panel there. And uh, we will no doubt be, be returning to this very important issue again. So thank you for okay. your attendance today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. OK, members, um, I think I just want to check with the clerk. There's been a number of issues raised there, which I outlined just before the panel left. Um, you've probably got those. Is there anything else out of those issues that, that I have? Go ahead, Carol. So, Chair, I appreciate that Donna and her team are coming in to look at the recommendations, but I'm far from happy. So um, I think we need to get the permanent secretary in, who's the SRO for this, because there are issues that both myself, Jonathan, and indeed others have raised in relation to the criticisms of the Justice O'Hara's report that quite clearly Donna and her team aren't going to uh, deal with. I also think that given the fact that there's been a number of assurance frameworks and even one of the questions that you finished on at the end, um, it seems that this is all process process. And I personally do not feel assured and my confidence levels in the department being able to respond to this, I have to say, are greatly diminished after this morning. If any family members watching that performance, they literally must be sitting in complete distress. So I would ask that we could reconsider uh, bringing the SRO back in to answer some of those questions that clearly Donna has said that she can't. Yeah, members content with that proposal? Yeah, thank you. Uh, anything else, members? In relation to that, okay, there's a there's a number of a number of actions that are obviously flowing from that, so we'll pick up on that again. Okay, I'm going to take another very very short break. There, it's uh, twelve thirty two now. If we could come back in eight minutes, so back for twelve forty to resume our session. And if you could take us out of broadcast, out of uh, public broadcasting, please. Senate Chamber Program. Okay, thank you, members. So we're moving on then to item seven, which is. Uh, SR 2021 forward slash 47, the recovery of health services charges amounts amendment regulations, NA 2021. I refer you there, members, to tab seven of your pack and in particular to the clerk's memo at tab 7.1. This SR provides for an inflationary uplift to the tariffs for payments recovered by the health service from compensation paid to those involved in road traffic accidents who require hospital treatment. Can I remind members that the committee considered the policy proposal for this SR at its meeting on the 25th of February 2021 and agreed that we were content with the proposed SR. The examiner of statutory rules has reported that she has no issues to raise on this SR. And uh, just, just to remind members, this is, this is the inflationary uplift that we see these on a, a sort of an annual basis. It uh, did come to us as an SL1, as I've mentioned there, and uh, we were content. So have members any further issues to wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No, thank you members. If not then, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 47, the recovery of health services charges amounts amendment regulations 2021 and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed, thank you members. 
Okay, members, moving on then to uh, correspondence. There's a couple of items there that I would like to draw your attention to initially. So item 8.2 is correspondence from the Minister providing further information in relation to COVID-19 indemnity arrangements. So uh, do members have any issues around that or would members be content to write to the department seeking further information on what that indemnity specifically provides cover for? I wasn't fully clear from the correspondence what it is specifically. So would members be yeah. content that we write to seek that information? Agreed. Yeah. Uh, Any other issues, members? Yeah, sure, sorry. Yes, Carol, uh, go ahead. Could we also ask, is this in relation to the uh, insurance uplifts around cybersecurity? The groups are being asked to um, fund themselves. It's anything up to an additional £4,000. Could we just ask that as well? Because uh, I'm not clear on it either. Yeah, members content to include that. I know that's a concern reflected from the CNB sector. So are members content that we include that question as part of that? Yeah, members content, thank you. Um, item then 8.5 is an analysis of consultation responses to the department's temporary changes to the health and social care framework document. Any comment on that particular correspondence members? And would members be content to note pending further engagement with the Department on Rebuilding Services, which is clearly going to be a significant part of our forward work? Members content to note for now. Yeah, thank you. Item, um, just one other item, 8.17 is correspondence from Mr. Allen from Alan Chambers, MLA, in relation to the commissioning of abortion services. Um, members, any comments in relation to that item? And I'm, I'm wondering, would members be content that we write to the minister in relation to this issue to ask what advice he has received on the commissioning of abortion services? Yes, yes, sir. Members correct. content with that? Yeah. Okay. And have members any comments or on any other, any other propose any other correspondence? There's one other one there I just want to flag briefly as well is 8.18 continuing healthcare. I wonder would members agree that we ask to be kept informed of the stakeholder group and if service user representatives and families will be included in that continuing healthcare work? Members content with that? Thank you. So any other items of correspondence that members wish to? Sure, just to table paper. Before we go to the table. Yeah, so I'm going to table papers there, Jerry. There's one item, there's a couple items there. Um, and if, if your item isn't isn't raised, then we'll, we'll come back to it. But I'll just move through the ones that I'm sort of flagging here at the minute. Uh, tab 8.19 is a response from the Minister providing an update on COVID testing. Um, that, that was received last week. So we received details of the amount of people involved in contact tracing. Uh, I think it was 46 on a full-time basis, 100 on a part-time basis, and 107 on a bank basis. We have still never fully got to the bottom of how many whole-time equivalent at any given time are working within that operation. So I just wonder, would committee members be content that we write to ask for a month-by-month -month breakdown of how that translated into, into staff hours month-by-month, -month, just so we get a picture of, of how much of that complement is being utilised? Would members be content with that? Yeah. The other one I had then was, uh, there's two others. Tab 8.21 is correspondence from an individual in relation to the restart of fertility treatments. Um, any any comments from members in relation to that issue? No, Charlie. Um, only that, um, I'm glad that we're continuing to pursue it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think... I think uh, I'll, I'll maybe I'll maybe check with with the clerk. Have we uh, have we a, a current correspondence in, or are we waiting response on in relation to that further information in that, or should we write again to the department and ask for an update? I, I think there was a letter issued. We can have a look and see if we can chase that up and get a further update on it. Yeah, please do. I think we do, we do want to keep to keep a bit of a focus on that. The other thing is then tabs 8.22 and 8.23 are correspondence from Fra McCann and Robbie Butler, MLAs, to advise of progress in relation to their private members bills for members information. So uh, do members have any comments in relation to either of those private members bills? 
No, okay. I know I know that FRAS is in relation to uh, charging car parking charges in, in hospitals, and I think that's something of of significant benefit potentially to staff and 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 in terms of inequalities. I think it plays a role there as well. And I know that Robbie's bill there is then in relation to um first responders. So, uh, Jerry, you wanted to come in there on an item of table? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Sure. Uh, 8.25, I, I think this is um, very, very important. This is the, the ROSA um, correspondence from the the, the, the protest at Ryder Square last week. Um, and I think it is uh, important for us to look at. I think there's been a um, a disproportionate uh, policing of uh, and handling out of notices of certain events compared to others. We had this protest. Uh, there was safe, uh, socially distant. People wore masks, and it was a it was a safe protest last week, um, from all accounts. But we had uh, protests of, of sorts uh, on beaches last week. Uh, I think in the Derry area, where there was um, seemingly no masks uh, and a sort of a hands off approach uh, being taken to it. So I think it's um, there's a responsibility on. The Department of Health on the Executive Office to really keep an eye on this because not only do we have a disproportionate policing of events, uh, we also have a disproportionate amount of fines going to the BAME, BAME community members. They make up 1.8% of the population, but are account for uh, just over 5%, sorry, 4.8% of, of fines. So it's very concerning, it's very worrying that people who are um, marginalized before the pandemic are disproportionately impacted by the, the police response, the fine response. So I think it's it's, uh, it's worth the committee noting this, but also really taking it forward and taking it up with the minister and, and other ministers going forward. Yeah. And should we should we therefore maybe a uh, forward forward the correspondence to both Minister of Health and maybe Department of Justice as well, just for information? To flag it. Yeah. 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 Okay, members content with that. Thank you. Um, anything else then on correspondence members? Chair. Chair. Uh, so I think I had Pam first and then Paula. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, and just to say, I actually agree with Jerry there on, on um, 8.25. I think there, there needs to be consistency and there's quite frankly has not been consistency across the board in terms of um, the issuing of fines. That's very clear to be seen. Uh, so I do welcome that uh been sent on to both health and justice. Um, but I wanted to raise 8.24, Chair, the um, the letter around from the APG on terminal illness around the support for dying people. Um, and I think it's, it's a really important issue and I think it would be good if the committee could agree to to support um, that call um, to, to have this um, as, as, a, as a subject um, Taken forward for the um, going from my head. Uh, from my head when we signed. Uh, you know, in, in terms of the uh, the overall plan, it's gone from my head. Do you, do you want me? Do you want me to go to Paula there? Do you want me to go to Paula there for a couple of minutes and come back to that, Pam? Uh, that's correct. Or do you want to go ahead? That's wrong. Yes, Paul, go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to come back to uh, Mr. Chambers' letter regarding the clarification from the Attorney General. Um, I, I have no problem with, with that information being sought. I think it's quite historic now, given the current events uh, that are actually even taking place in, in the Westminster today. So I'm just wondering if we could extend that request for information either from the Attorney General or Legal Services to get an updated position in relation to the new regulations that have been laid this week and what will be the implications for our work regarding the scrutiny of Mr. Giffen's bill. Thank you. Chair, can I come in on that? Well, maybe one of the Um Yes, go ahead, Carol. Yeah. So um, my understanding is that the Attorney General advises the executive and their her advice doesn't go beyond that. But if there, you know, if there's an, you know, then there may be a, a need to have uh, some legal advice to us following all the recent events. I have no issue with that. Yeah, and I see Alan's hand will come to you in a second, Alan. We're also, we also are going into a, a discussion in, in closed session on the PMBs, which we maybe can get more information from the clerk in relation to those processes. Alan, were you looking in there?
Sorry, I'm can not, you hear I'm me? I'm not hearing anything back from Alan. Yes, I'm hearing you now. Go ahead now, please. Yeah. Sorry about that, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, so just in relation to uh, Jerry's point there about the fines, and, and we're writing to the Department of Health and we're writing to the Department of Justice. I'm just wondering, uh, should we be spreading the net a little bit further on that? Because the Department of Health will come back and say they set the regulations, they do not police them, which is probably correct. The uh, Justice Minister will come back and say uh, this is an operational matter for the police and I can't interfere in operational matters and will probably direct you to the policing board who have oversight of, uh, of the conduct of the police. So, uh, you know, I think those uh, two letters uh, that we propose to send uh, may, may really not advance uh, the, uh, the issue any. Uh, I think we do need to be maybe speaking uh, directly to the uh, policing board as well and asking them for their opinion because ultimately they have they have the oversight and the responsibility for the actions of the police. So I would suggest that that would be maybe a third uh, recipient of, of a letter from the committee. Thank you. Okay, Alan, members content with Alan's proposal? I think it's I think it's a sensible a sensible enough one. It is an issue where we need to see consistency, and so I think that would be useful enough. Okay, so I'll go back to you, Pam, then in relation to your. Yes, yeah, sorry, Chair, my mind just completely went blank there. No, it was it's around the support for people impacted by death, dying, and bereavement, and the program for government was the words I was looking for. The program for government. So, I think it's obviously. It comes to to us all. I think it it would be something that it is really vital going forward. Especially, I think it's uh, been really highlighted in this past year uh, how important it is that um, that there is that provision and that we're there is a concentration on. It. So, I think as a committee, if we could support that call to have that particular subject included in the program for government, I think that would be really good. And I'd like to make a proposal. Of something. Um, thought, yeah, thought, thought, thoughts from members in relation to that. Um, I'm not seeing any any indications there. I think I think it absolutely is an important area. I'm just not a uh, personally not sure how it fits in in terms of the outcomes and and what the what the measurements around it are. But I think uh, our members content generally that the committee does support does support the the importance and that uh, that that the outcome the program for government would in some format uh, include that as a as a. As, as part of the programme for government. Are members broadly content with that? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay, members, thank you for that. Yeah, mo yeah moving. Was someone else looking in there? No. Okay. So moving on then, members, to the forward work programme. Members will note that the draft forward work programme only goes as far as the end of April. That's to allow for the scheduling of oral evidence sessions for the two bills, which have now been referred to the committee. We will schedule a more detailed discussion on the forward work programme at their first meeting after Easter, because we are going to have to anticipate how we deal with all the legislative programme and all the many other strands that we're trying to, to focus on. So I think a, a very early and our first meeting, we'll do a more of a dedicated forward work programme session if members are content with that. Yeah. I'd also like to highlight an upcoming informal meeting on cancer services from the committee and the impact that COVID-19 has had on those services. So we have scheduled that in for Wednesday, the 14th of April at 11.30 a.m. on Microsoft Teams. A number of groups over the past period of time have written to the committee and they have been invited along with a number of the cancer char charities. The Assembly's engagement team has had to set up this informal event and further information and a programme will be issued to members in due course, but I just would, would like that members would note that in their diaries. I know they are all under pressure in terms of commitments, but that's the 14th of April at 11.30. And I think in terms of rebuilding cancer services, it will be a key opportunity, similar to the meeting we did with, with surgeons and with the Children's uh, Law Centre and uh, Children's Law Centre and VIPIC. I think these are important engagements to inform the committees for their scrutiny of all those, all those issues. So are members content to note the forward work programme as outlined there? Yeah, thank you, members. Okay, any other business today, members, before we go to date and time place of the next meeting and then into our closed session on the PMBs? Um, any other business? No, thank you, members. So date, time and place of next meeting, 
will be on Thursday, April Thursday. Uh, I don't have a date for that, but it was in the previous section. Thursday the thir- Thursday the fourth. Thursday the fifteenth of April. I think am I right there, Clark? Yeah. Thursday the fifteenth of April at nine thirty a.m. via video link. So, um, so members, we will now continue in closed session, and we we can go straight into that session. So, can you take us out of broadcasting, please, Clark? Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program.